All right, welcome to the College of Complexes. My name is Tim, your illustrious host for the College of Complexes. I'd like to welcome everyone to the college tonight. There are two rules of the college. One is, uh, the first one is uh, one fool at a time. And the second is no personal attacks. That means I can't call Charlie a schmuck, but you know, I usually wind up doing so anyway. But anyway, um, the college consists of the following format. First, there's a brief announcements period. Then we'll let Stan uh, do his presentation. Then we'll have questions and answers. And we'd like to have questions instead of, you know, for the speaker and not a lot of long diatribes of, of stuff because after the question and answer period's over with, you'll each get a set amount of time, usually about three to five minutes or so to uh, rebut the speaker. We generally finish up about nine o'clock, but since we're on Zoom, we can go a little bit longer if people want to stick around. And after the Zoom call, after we dismiss, I usually stick around for a while just to make sure everybody's there. All right, so uh, I think I covered everything. Pretty much everybody knows the rules here and uh, we'll, uh, you know, the only time I get a little upset is when somebody's monopolizing the conversation. I think I trust all the were adults, so you know how to, you know, use appropriate discipline. Um, with that, Charlie, if you're ready with the announcements, so let's get started here. Okay, welcome everyone to meeting number 3,656 of the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Uh, this is little uh, uh, notice that we do have a uh, two ways of learning about upcoming programs. We have a Google email group and we also have a meetup group and there's instructions on how to join right on the upper part of the uh, main website of the College of Complexes. And there's not much traffic on these. We kind of confine it to uh, notices of the upcoming program each Saturday. Now, although I am not a capitalist, I will give an advertisement for our upcoming programs. I see the speakers here tonight and I'm coming on March 19th. D Knight will tell us about he wrote a memoir and a manifesto covering five decades of resistance. So this was many, many events over that period of time. And it should be a very multifaceted, interesting program. Mm. Um, and I may write a manifesto myself now I think uh. about it. On May, on May 26th, she's here. March well, 26th. March 26th, Dan <clears throat> Lee will talk about how she maintains there's a yin-yang dynamism operative in the world. So that's on March the 26th. Transitioning into April, the Libertarian Party will be featuring one of their candidates uh, running for office in a general discussion of their uh, position on issues. So uh, always an interesting uh, exchange of ideas regarding the proper uh, amount of government in the world. Now, we beginning in April, we're going to have four, count them, one, two, three, four uh, programs relevant to Earth Day. We're beginning with April the 9th, a Chicago-based organization, the One Earth Collective. <laughs> they put on the uh, film programs uh, and so forth and engage in other activities. April the 9th, April the 16th, we'll be discussing uh, concepts regarding the use of hydrogen. I know they're trying these out on railroads, uh, diesel engines. Hmm. So that's April the 16th. Uh, and there's a blimp, they're, they want to they wanna, they wanna put out blimps again. Uh, sleek fast, they're pretty fast too. April the 23rd, the Illinois Green Party, to which I am affiliated, will be returning and they're featuring their candidates for the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Very important. You all need water, I presume. Uh, anyhow, April the 23rd. On April the 30th, we're gonna be looking at the issue of forest 
And I am going to prove that there's a primitive species living in those forests. I've worked pretty hard on this. And I think attendance should be mandatory. How does that uh, have how does that have anything to do with Earth Day, Charles? The forest, the US forests, I call about lumber industry. What there's no more poignant topic than the US uh, trees. Bees are America's renewable resource, Charlie. Yeah, of course. Nice try, Phil. All right. Transitioning in the May, we're gonna feature our our our, on May 7th, we're going to feature our special May Day speaker, and we're going to host another organization to which I'm affiliated, the uh, uh, IWW, the Industrial Workers of the World, the Wobblies, uh, the, the National Secretary uh, Treasurer, General Secretary Treasurer will be speaking. So we got the the chief in charge. We got really locked out on that. They're sending uh, the woman who's running the operation these days. On May the 14th, this is supposed to be an interesting one. They're having an event, a training event this week, as a matter of fact, I believe, the Truth Brigade. Said this is what you guys really need because some of you can't ascertain what is true and what is false. On May the 21st, um, or, or uh, May the oh, 21st, uh, Trump, uh, Stanfield Smith will be returning. He maintains that Trump is not a fascist. He's got other assertions regarding that. The did I make up that title? What? Did, did you make that title or did I? No, sir, that I do not make up titles or descriptions. If you want to edit it, that's fine. Ah, uh, yes. No, I do not, under any circumstances, okay. make up titles or descriptions for speakers. I'll edit it. Okay. On May the 28th, then, uh, we're going to have a group regarding the influx of Trump people at school board meetings. They have concerns regarding uh, the curriculum and various COVID mandates and so forth. But there's a, a local organization has researched this uh, topic. Transitioning into June, we're, we're working on scheduling somebody for June the 4th. Uh, so the next open dates I would rec say are 11, 18, and 25. Uh, also one other thing, we have a, a page, a relatively new week. <laughs> and I have to refresh this. But we have videos posted that are free on YouTube, uh, documentaries, movies, and so forth. Some of these were submitted by speakers. So take a look at that. There's a, a link provided on the front page of the College Complex's website. And that's it. Thank you very much, everyone. Take it away, Tim. I'd also like to remind everybody that we do have a Texas campus of the College of Complexes. It meets every Thursday. <coughs> And they too also are right now meeting on Zoom on the 17th. It is immoral to file a re, uh, no fly zone in Ukraine. They have uh, Thursday the 24th, How to Make Meaning, which is Bob Lichtenberg. And uh, they also have a plug for our schedule. That, uh, so you have two times to get to the college on, th on, on Thursday night at six o'clock and at uh, Saturday at six o'clock. And uh, you know, you're always welcome to log in there too as well. Now, are there any other announcements for the good of the club before we open it up to stand, to stand tonight for his speech? I would like to encourage people to come Thursday nights because I find it hard to fight against NATO by myself. Okay, um, you this know, is on Thursday. So yeah, if y'all right. could come back then, that'd be great. What's happening on Thursday? The Thursday night uh, Dallas Zoom meeting is the um, they're smart on. people, but just totally, you know, mass media indoctrinated to think NATO is fine. You know, <laughs> no fly zones are fine. All right, all right, into the program. Into the program now. All right. Okay. All right.
I'll close out the announcements unless Jan's got something from the NRC or something, because Jan usually has something to contribute if you have an announcement, Jan. I guess not. All right, Stan, uh, the microphone's yours. I'll ask everybody to mute during Stan's presentation, and then we'll unmute when we uh, uh, at the at the uh, at the uh, question and answer period. So, Stan, at the uh, microphone's yours. Go ahead and take it away. Okay, thanks, Tim, and thanks, Charles, and hello, everybody else. Um, I'll try to not keep this too long. I'll go over uh, maybe a little summary of what I'll talk about. Uh, be who and what caused this crisis? Uh, what was the Min Minsk agreement about the Nazis in the Ukraine, US bio labs in the Ukraine, the corporate media and government fake news about the war, uh, the new McCarthyism that is coming out of this, and the cutting social programs to fund, help fund the war. And if I have time, I have more on the role of NATO in the war. And then uh, finally, what I think some of the results will be of this war. Uh, so who caused this crisis? First, it's, uh, I would say, NATO. NATO should have become obsolete with the collapse of the Warsaw Pact back in 19... 91. It, it existed to combat the, to combat the Soviet, Soviet bloc. Now, at that time, there were 16 members in NATO. Now, that Soviet bloc disappeared 30 years ago. And we were told at the time that after the collapse of the Soviet bloc, we would get a peace dividend. But instead, if you remember, if you're old enough, we we're supposed to get this big peace dividend a lot of money for social programs here. But instead, with US made up stories to start wars elsewhere, in Iraq in 1991, Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, Iraq again in 2003, Syria and Libya. And I guess there are probably other ones I forgot. In the meantime, uh, during that period, the US and NATO had steadily marched towards Russia since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, Gorbachev and Bush Sr., when they met, uh, I don't know exactly what year, they promised uh, Gorbachev, they made an agreement that East Germany could join West Germany and become part of NATO, but NATO would not expand further east. But now it's 30 members and all there, two of them are now on Russia's borders. Now, NATO spends a trillion dollars a year. That's his budget. Trillion dollars a year is spent by NATO on military. That's 20 times the size of Russia's military budget. It's 20 times the size of Russia's military budget. And Russia is not the Soviet Union anymore. It's a little, uh, relatively little country in terms of like, the economy is the same size as Texas, Texas economy. Now behind this committee to expand NATO uh, back in the 1990s, which has led us to where situation we are now, it was founded by the vice president of who? The Lockheed Martin. That was who founded this committee to expand NATO, which is the, one of the major armaments companies which made a fortune when its stock went way up when Russia finally invaded uh, Ukraine February 24. Uh, if I have time, I, I can review a little of the RAND Corporation document that they made for the US government, which was written in 2019, basically pointing out a how-to guide to, as the title of the document is, is overextending and unbalancing Russia, which listed a whole series of things that the NATO and US could do to uh, wreck uh, Russia. Now the US and NATO st stated in April 2006 that it was going to make Georgia and Ukraine part of NATO. Uh, Russia drew the line with Georgia and Ukraine. He said if these two Russia Russia said if these two countries joined NATO, it would be a threat to its own existence. And Russia even had a war with Georgia in 2008 over, I think, that issue. But I'm, um, 
I didn't check on that, I forgot. Um, now, even the National Security Agency said in the 2015 in its annual report that Russia was convinced that US was aiming for regime change in Russia. Now, the second issue that leading up to this war besides the expansion of NATO is that what was going on in the Ukraine. Now, in 2014, the US organized a coup against the elected government in Ukraine. This was the Maidan coup elect against elected President uh, Yanukovych, who was corrupt and who was, there was legitimacy to some of the demands of the people had to get rid of him. But he was, um, it was taken over by, I thought everybody's on mute. Um, this was basically taken over by right-wing forces, this, uh, these protests, and it became a coup. Now, the coup was promoted by U.S. figures Victoria Newland and John McCain, who are big, two big war hawks. Newland was instrumental in organizing the coup, even selecting who was going to be the president of uh, Ukraine after they overthrew the government. That's their U.S.'s commitment to democracy in Ukraine. Um, as soon as the UK, <coughs> as the coup government came to power, they immediately acted with hostility towards its Russian speaking citizens. Now there's one in six Ukrainians is an ethnic Russian and one in three speak Russian as a native language. So it's a very heavily Russian uh, country. Yet on the first day of the coup, the, the coup regime acted to make sure that, that declared that Russia would no longer be an official state language. This was followed by more actions of hostility, as you could see in the film, Crimes of the Euro Maiden Nazis, Euro Maidan Nazis, it's a video that shows a convoy of buses going back to Crimea being attacked by these, uh, these uh, right-wing forces in, uh, in Ukraine. In Odessa, I forget, maybe 2015, over 30 opponents of the coup, coup government who had protested against the, government, the coup died when they were attacked in the Odessa, uh, Odessa trade union building. It was set on fire and they were either uh, killed coming out or burned to death inside. And that you could see more about and more about this history of the US coup in Ukraine from Oliver Stone's film, Ukraine on Fire, which I see it's not so easy to see on the internet anymore because it kind of removed that information in it. Now, in the, in the consequence of, uh, as a result of these actions by these right-wing forces against the Russian uh, uh, back, the Russian Ukrainians of Russian background, the Donbass region separated into its own republics, uh, Donetsk and Luhansk, and also Crimea succeeded, seceded and became part of Russia. Now, these are heavily Russian areas of the Ukraine, and they didn't want to participate, be part of Ukraine run by this anti-Russian coup government, so they wanted to separate. In Crimea, there was a referendum vote on returning to Russia with an 83% turnout and 97% voting in favor. Now, Rus Crimea has been part of Russia since 1783. Uh, it was... Uh, the Soviet Union made uh, Crimea part of the Ukraine in 1954. Uh, the, the Ukrainian Civil War began when these two regions separated. This was back in 2014-2015, in and this Civil War had been going on for eight years, which leading up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, in 2015, a, an, a Minsk agreement, that's M-I-N-S-K, named after the city, made, they made an agreement to stop the fighting in these, uh, between these Ukrainian nationalist Ukrainians and Russian Ukrainians. Um, 
in these areas that we're trying to separate or become independent. Um, they called for a, cease a ceasefire or a constitutional reform in Ukraine, granting self-government to certain areas of the Donbass and restoring of the state border to the Ukrainian government, which means reincorporating these regions into Ukraine again. The Russian, the Ukrainian, and the, and the separatist uh, leaders, those governments all agreed to these agreements and so did the US, France, and other European powers. But in practice, the US and Ukraine did not follow the Minsk Agreement. And it so began a civil war in these areas that continued from about 2014 up till today. As a result, there's been 14,000 dead in that area. And 80% of them have been people in the separatist regions who have wanted to separate from Ukraine. So most of the attacks are coming. Forth. I can always turn it off. But, um, um, Ukraine there was, a, when the Ukrainians were attacking these people, the Russian Ukrainians in this region, they were not fighting Russian soldiers. They were, Russian soldiers were only there in a short period in August, August to September 2014 and January, February 2015. All, hey, Tim, can you mute everybody? I have been. I have been. There's been some new pe people coming in, so that's... Oh. that's well, something. instruct them that if they're not talking, to mute their mic. I have, I, we've already- It's very about. disturbing. Yeah, okay, so where are we? Um, the fighting in these regions of the Donbass, where it is, it's Donetsk, Crimea, and um, Luhansk. Okay, real, we, quick, real, real quick, Stan, I gotta leave for about 10 minutes or so. So, you know, um, I will be back shortly, okay? So, you know, my apologies. Um, so please continue. I'll be back in less than 10 minutes, okay? So is anybody can control other people coming in and making noise? Uh, do you know how to... I'm, try, I'm trying to get the uh, host controls over to Charlie. Yeah. He's okay. I'll uh, be, don't worry. Uh, nobody will be able to come in while I'm gone. Just, all right. Okay. Um, so most of the fighting in these areas over the last eight years was between Ukrainians themselves, not Russians, Russian citizens. And the Minsk Accords, if they had been followed by the US and Ukraine, would have avoided the present war. Now, uh, to move on to uh, Zelensky, the president of the Ukraine right now, um, he has banned opposition newspapers. He's jailed the leader of an opposition party and the U.S. has encouraged him to do that, which, while the U.S. is defending, says it's defending freedom of democracy, if people really believe that anymore, then why is the U.S. encouraging him to do that? In March 24, 2021, which is almost a year ago, Zelensky said that Ukraine was going to take back Crimea, which would have provoked a war with Russia. Um, in late 2021, Ukraine was getting so closely connected to NATO that it was basically a member of NATO. The U.S. was arming NATO, I mean, arming Ukraine back in 2017 by, it started with Trump, who some people like to say was a puppet of uh, Putin, but here it was Trump who started this major uh, influx of arms to Ukraine to fight uh, against the uh, the Russian peoples in the Russian areas, speaking areas of Ukraine. Uh, five days before the Russian invasion, there was a very heavy, heavy shelling of the Donbass, the parts of the region that was uh, were full of Russian-speaking Ukrainians. An organization of, for security and cooperation in Europe said that 80% of the attacks that have been going on in this area were initiated by the Ukrainian government. At that time, the Ukraine had 60 to 100,000 troops there. Um, 
So that goes to show if you can, you probably remember back then that the U.S. was constantly based. Actually, Biden was basically kind of goading Putin to invade and game to the point where you know, once they, they escalated the fighting in that area to such an extent that Russia did finally invade on February 24th, uh, 2022. So after that day, we have a real war going on in the Ukraine, over all of Ukraine, not just in that one region. So that's, cannot say this war began with the Russian invasion. It began with the coup in Ukraine in 2014. Now, Russia's demands now are that Ukraine halt its military activity, change its constitution to become a neutral state so it won't join NATO, and it recognized Crimea as Russian territory and recognizes the independence for the two separate regions called Donetsk and Lugansk. Um, it's interesting to note that the NED, the National Endowment for the Democracy, which is a Victoria Newland by coincidence, <laughs> is uh, on the board of that company that was set up by um, Reagan in the 1980s to take to do the work that the CIA used to do. They had spent 22 million and a half, 22.5 million dollars in the Ukraine between 2014 to the present, funding different uh, nationalist groups, different anti-Russian groups. And all this information on their website has been recently, it was removed on February 25th, so you can no longer find it there. This was a part uh, to help the US sell the story that the Russian invasion was unprovoked. So you wouldn't be seeing what the US was doing during this whole period. Now we've probably all read about the role of Nazis in the Ukraine. Even uh, Biden met with the leader of the Svoboda party, which is a neo-Nazi party. This was back when he was vice president. Ukraine is the only nation in the world that has a neo-Nazi battalion in its armed forces called the Azaz Battalion. Its commander, Andriy Beletsky, said that Ukraine's mission was, quote, is to lead the white races of the world in a final crusade against the Semitic-led Untermenschen, end quote. That sounds pretty much like plagiarizing Hitler. Um, he's a member of the Ukraine's parliament, and he's been promoted to lieutenant colonel in the Ukraine police forces. In the Ukraine since the coup they, in 2014, Streets and stadiums have been named after big, two big Nazi collaborators in World War II, one of them being Bandura. The other one, I'm not sure who it is. Um, it's also interesting that in December 2021, there was a UN resolution condemning Nazism. And in, there are only two countries in the world who voted against this resolution to condemn Nazism. And they were the United States and the Ukraine. And it's interesting, this was made by the Democratic administration of Biden, who's supposed to be anti-Trump, anti-fascist. And here they are voting against uh, any... Uh, condemnation of Nazi fascists. Now about the US military bio labs in the Ukraine, which is just coming out. Uh, the US is trying to deny it, but it's uh, not gonna be very effective. There is a long report by the Russian ambassador to the, in the security, UM ambassador in the Security Council. And there's also been rather detailed uh, reports on it by Aaron Mate or Jimmy Dore. And even uh, Tucker Carlson has had some very good shows on these weapons of mass destruction that the US has in Ukraine. 
and how the how Victoria Newland is trying to cover up what they were. And they don't really Victoria Newland says that these kind of uh, bio uh, bio lab military bio labs exist in the Ukraine, but they are not formally, you know, they're not US bio lab. They're Ukrainian military bio labs that the US is just working in. But she doesn't answer to really answer the question is that US have bio labs in the Ukraine. So and now, now the US is trying to say that the Russia is making up the story of US bio labs to stage a chemical attack. And it's interesting, I was reading something from Caitlin Johnstone, who said that this little quote is, so Russia is preparing to stage a chemical attack. And also the Russian chemical attack might look like Ukrainians or Western governments committing a chemical attack. And also the evidence for this is secret and the details are secret and the government officials advancing this claim are secret. And also you can believe that Russia's military offensive is faltering. Now this is very similar to like what the spin they tried to do with Syria when these uh, ISIS forces launched chemical attacks and blamed it on the uh, uh, Assad government. So I don't know what will happen with these bio labs. I think there's like 25 or 30 of them in the Ukraine. And what uh, if they are actually doing biological research? Then what is the big deal to the U.S. government that the Russia finds these uh, labs? It's just regular biological research. It's like taking over a hospital. So what? It's not a threat to anybody. So obviously the U.S. government is hiding something. Now I could go over some of the uh, fake news about uh, that we've heard. Uh, I haven't kept track of it every day because there's too much to keep track of. I really don't read the news about what's going on in the war because I, I don't believe what the U.S. says and I don't believe uh, what Russia says. But maybe there are reports on how many Russian soldiers are are been killed, I would imagine that they are telling, they are not underestimating, or they're not overestimating when they say how many have been killed. Now you might have read in the, the news that's come out in the media that Russian troops attacked a nuclear power plant in the Ukraine. But the fire there was started by Ukrainian forces and they were not started at the nuclear power plant, but a place adjacent to the plant. And there was no danger to the plant. There was also a video, video from the uh, video game Arma 3 presented as videos of the Ukrainian war, but they had to take it down when the company, I'm not sure what the name of the company is, said they would sue them for copyright violation if they kept posting this as a uh, video of the Iraq uh, Ukraine war when it was from their video game. There was a video of a Russian tank running over a car in the street, but NBC itself admitted, quote, it wasn't immediately clear if the armored vehicle was Russian or Ukrainian hardware or where, when this crash took place, end quote. Then there was the story of the ghost of Kiev plane that shot down six jets. Six jets. The video of that happening also came from a, uh, the film of that happening also came from a video game. Uh, we saw pictures in the beginning of the war of Zelensky dressed in military gear, but these were pictures were taken long before the war broke out. We heard the story of 13 Ukrainian soldiers on Snake Island that told a Russian warship to go F themselves and then fought to the death. But in fact, they were all captured alive. We saw, I saw a video of uh, supposedly Russian planes flying over Kiev, but actually they were Russian planes flying over Moscow, I think, in some uh, national day. Um, they showed a power plant exploding in Luhansk and say when it was actually a chemical plant blowing up in Tianjin, China in 2015. They showed uh, 
drone strikes that uh, the Russians were supposedly making that were actually dr Turkish drone strikes in Syria and the Israel bombing in Gaza and combat in, Li in Libya in 2011 are all presented as what was happening in Ukraine. And then they have that one picture of that blonde uh, Palestinian girl with blue eyes um, yelling at a Israeli soldier. And that was uh, presented as uh, this is a, some Ukrainian hero girl yelling at Russian soldiers to get out of uh, Ukraine. Of course, this is not the only fake news we hear about Russia. The whole Russiagate story is now we know is fake news. It was just made up by uh, the Hillary Clinton campaign. Um, we can remember back then that Russiagate was supposed to be the equivalent of Pearl Harbor. Remember, some politicians said that, but they don't think they have any problem with, uh, they think uh, Russia should not be upset about uh, U Ukraine becoming part of NATO. Uh, we heard these stories about a couple of years ago when uh, Trump was going to take soldiers out of uh, Afghanistan. We heard the story that Russia was paying the Taliban $100,000 for every US soldier they killed. And we can remember in the build up to the war in 1990 against Iraq, that Iraqi soldiers allegedly took babies out of baby incubators in Kuwait hospitals and left the babies to die in the floor. Then we can remember how in the Gulf of Tarkin, the US made up a story about North Vietnam attacking a US destroyer which gave the green light for the full-scale US invasion of Vietnam. And then we can remember how Colin Powell went to the United Nations Security Council and held up this little vial and said, this is, you know, Saddam Hussein has all these weapons of mass destruction in, in Iraq and we have to do something. Now, these are all totally made up stories, just like these stories we're getting now about uh, Ukraine. It's also interesting that now we know that the Russian guy ambassador could go to UN Security Council and show vials that this is what the US has been doing in, in the Ukraine. Um, it's also interesting while the US is making up these all these fake news stories about the Ukraine and Russia that they are censoring the Russian media. Now, why would they be censoring the Russian media if they're telling the truth? They wouldn't have no reason to do that. Um, now, the new McCarthyism that is going on now, which is rather, well, there's been new McCarthyism going on for uh, some time now with restrictions on the internet and the freedom of what you can post on the internet. But with this beginning of this war, it's gotten worse. Um, you had a Russian opera singer canceled at the Metropolitan Opera in New York because she was Russian and she wouldn't, I don't know if she asked to say something about Putin or not, but she was canceled because you're Russian, so you're fired, get out of here. And Carnegie Hall and Vanilla, Vienna Philharmonic fired two Russian artists while the conductor of the Vienna Philharmonic got fired and also a pianist got booted from a series of planned concerts because the two men wouldn't uh, condemn Putin. Now it's rather interesting because I've been to countries like um, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, China, Vietnam, North Korea, and nobody there ever asked me, well, you have to condemn what the US is doing to our country. No, they don't leave me alone. They don't expect demand anything of me, but this is what's being demanded in the free world of some Russians, which you have to remember Germany and the United States, we're not at war with Russia. So why would they be demanded? Well, this just uh, this kind of McCarthyism. Also, it's like the University of Milan in Italy has banned the teaching of Dostoevsky, who was, you know, 19th century uh, writer who actually spent time in Siberia for uh, having banned books. 
now you can't you can't read him or teach him in University of Milan because he's Russian. Uh, the Bolshoi Theater Company has been canceled in London and Madrid. Even uh, Russian cats, that's C-A-T-S, cats, have been banned from cat exhibits, you know, the big cat shows. Russian cats are no longer allowed to go there, so Russian cats are verboten. Uh, Russia and Sputnik have been the two Russian uh, uh, internet uh, stations have been blocked in Europe. Uh, RT has been closed here in the United States. And there's a US woman called Elena Branson who led a quote, I love Russia campaign. And she was charged with being an agent, a foreign agent and for failing to register as one. Now, you'd be charged as a foreign agent if you say, I wanna have a campaign, I love Russia, but you wanna have a campaign, I love Ukraine, I'm sure that's yeah, no problem. There, no one's gonna say, oh, you're a foreign agent. Um, I heard that uh, today or yesterday, the Cardiff Symphony Orchestra, which I think is in England, removed their all Tchaikovsky program because Tchaikovsky is, um, Russian, also from the 19th century. Um, Facebook and Instagram have also allowed some countries that made it okay for people to uh, use their platforms to call for violence against Russians and against Russian soldiers. And they've also allowed some posts that call for the death to uh, death of uh, President Putin and the Belarusian President Lukashenko. Facebook also allows praise of neo-Nazi battalions as long as it is, it is fighting uh, the neo-Nazi Azov battalions as long as it's fighting Russia. All this, this behavior by Facebook has been condemned by the UN General Secretary. Now, meanwhile, um, now, it came out yesterday or two days ago, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is now at a new high, not seen in 3 million years. But combating global warming is now dropped. It's not being discussed. And that's basically the case with the Build Bet Better program. And single payer is also, you know, forget about it. We're not talking about it. And the $15 an hour minimum wage, forget about it. We're not talking about it. You got to talk about Ukraine all the time. It's just it's, this war is just an excuse to uh, not fund any social programs for the US people, um, which again, United States is not involved in a war in the Ukraine. It's Ukraine and Russia. There's even a 15.6 uh, billion dollar package to combat COVID has been cut. And 13.6 billion of that goes to military and non-military aid to Ukraine. So that's just another subsidy for the armament industries. I saw <coughs> on Twitter the other day, it said the stock prices of Lockheed Martin, Genera, Dyna General Dynamics, Northrop Grumman, and Raytheon, which are four big, uh, hey, Tim. <laughs> Lockheed Martin, General Dynamics, Northrop M Grumman, and Raytheon are our four big um, military contractor companies. Is that right after Russia invaded Ukraine, their stock prices reached a 52 week high. So these people were pushing for the war. Yeah, stock market. Uh, Lockheed oh, Martin. Joe Jennings needs to uh, mute. Joe Jennings. Um, Lockheed Martin's its stock since November to, to March 7th, its stock price went up 21.5%. Chevron, its stock price went up. 22.4 percent this is just in three months you know last three months stock market been going down if you have any stock you see it's going down but all these companies are going up exxon is went up 14 percent so it, this was some part of an article of all the investments that congress people made in the last three months in all these uh 
energy companies, military countries, uh, uh, companies and piping com companies to show how much money they made in their stock purchases in the last three months since they knew that they were going to be they were going to be starting to provoking Russia into a war with the Ukraine. Now, what are some of the results of this war going to be? I think uh, shown that Russia has much more resolve to win this war than the U.S. does. The U.S. made promises to U.S. to Ukraine. It instigated Ukraine, but then it abandoned it. I think the U.S. plan with Ukraine is to turn Ukraine into another Afghanistan or Libya or Syria, the way it was a couple of years ago. It's not really, and you U.S. knows it can't. Ukraine cannot win that war. All it can do is just turn that uh, whole bog Russia down in a war for a long time and kill a lot of innocent people in the Ukraine for no good reason, except help make these military contractor companies money. Now you can notice that the US is never talking about negotiations. They always, uh, they just, there's no discussion in negotiations, all the stuff in the news, they don't talk about that. Um, what the US wants to do is reduce Russian economic influence in the European energy market, which uh, they have done. And they also want to justify increasing the US war budget, which they have done. And they want to facilitate the sale of war material to NATO vassals, which they have done. And um, another result of this is, as you know, the inflation here is going to go up even more. And inflation in Europe is even going up higher. Um, energy prices uh, a week ago had risen 25%. Oh, no, sorry, it skyrocketed in Europe. But 25% of the world natural gas comes from Russia. So obviously, you're going to boycott the Russian gas, then price of it, you're going to pay for gas is going to go up. 70% of the world's wheat also comes from Russia. Now, but also in the price of oil, it went from $80 a barrel in mid-January to $130. And I think now it's about $115. Now you, you might have forgotten, I was looking into the price of gas. In April 2020, which is almost two years ago, a gallon of gas cost $1.94. That's a nationwide, nationwide, $1.94 a gallon. In March 2021, the price of gas was 282. Now it's what over four dollars. But only eight percent of our oil and gas comes from Russia. So why exactly is the price of gas going up so high? They're blaming it on Russia, but uh, it's just these oil companies are just using it as an excuse to jack up the price. It's supposed to be freedom gas that we're paying. Um, in 2021 alone, these gas companies, Exxon Mobil, Shell, uh, British Petroleum, and Chevron, they made combined profits of $75 billion. That's just profits, not just, just the handout to their rich uh, dividends and so on. And I don't know how much they're going to be making now because the price of gas has not really gone up that much. There's what they call anticipatory pricing. They, they think the price will be higher later, so they raise it now. You know, that's a lot of times what places do in times of inflation. That's what these companies are doing. But there's no reason if 8% of our oil and gas comes from Russia that the price of gas has doubled. Um, now, I also expect that the Democrats will lose the election in 2022 and probably in 2024 because people are going to be so pissed off at them uh, how the stock market's going down, inflation is going up, uh, they haven't come through with any of their promises when they ran the election. Um, another consequence of this uh, war will be that the international economy is going to suffer and it may lead to a global recession. These policies that US is taking, sanctioning Russia and China and all these other countries is going to accelerate the, the Russia, China, India, Turkey, Iran, Venezuela, accelerate their abandoning the use of the US dollar. Now, 
Russia and China and India are pretty big countries with the major part of the world economy. And if these countries get off using the dollar for international trade, which Russia now has to, I guess, the US, e the US economy would collapse if the US dollar was no longer the world reserve currency. I mean, US, it, it's the only way we can fund our national debt is through, because it's the world currency. Um, what the US is doing under Biden is like what uh, Obama was doing. He's driving Russia and China into a new alliance. It's something that I remember Trump always warned against doing. It's like you're you're pushing the, our two enemies into an alliance rather than trying to divide them. But that's what the, Biden is doing right now. And I would also expect that economically, the China will become further ahead of the United States than otherwise would have been the case if there was no war. So I think the United States and Russia will most likely go to some degree of economic recession or decline because of this war and the rising prices. And China is not really affected. And I remember I did read that Chinese are showing their support for Russia in this war by buying a lot of uh, Russian goods in China is being, uh, getting sold out. Everybody wants to help Russia there, so they buy their stuff. Um, I guess I talked to them almost, and let me see if I have anything else. If you want, you could look at some of this article by the RAND Corporation called Overextending and Unbalancing Russia, which talks about trade and financial sanctions and the need to get other countries to go along with trade and financial sanctions, how to stop Europe from importing Russian oil uh, gas, about how to effective uh, providing more lethal aid, military aid to Ukraine will help uh, disrupt Russia. This is all from 2019. This is just what the US is doing right now. This has all been basically pretty well planned in advance, which is not to say that uh, I think what Russia had some other alternatives besides invading Ukraine like it did. It could have gone to the UN and made more complaints to the UN about the US and Ukraine, what they were doing, and to get more um, informed the rest of the world more to counter the US propaganda. Uh, they could have done other things besides that, which, oh well, I guess I'll stop. It's almost an hour, so I'll stop and take uh, questions. Okay. All right, let's take our speaker. Okay, we're going to proceed to the second and third parts of our program. Uh, the next section is a question period. Yep. And you should uh, keep it in a You should approach. ask questions. If you there, Tim? Yes, I'm here. Oh, yes, all sir. right. Well, let me finish then. You should ask questions. And if it goes too long and you hear the word question, that would be please proceed. The next part is our remarks and our rebuttal period. Now, that's the opportunity for people who want to give a little speech, I guess maybe five minutes um or so uh to give their remarks or regarding the situation in the presentation i might also add uh, mr speaker we've got quite a sizable audience so perhaps uh, personally uh maybe if you kept your answers uh a little briefer uh it would be an opportunity for others to make questions thank you tim it's all yours all right, so now go ahead and unmute yourselves. We got, uh, all right, I'd like you guys to raise your hands for questions. The first one we have is Michael Kazanjian. So Mike, uh, take it away. And then we got that RR Tiki there, who I'm not sure who it is, but uh, you'll be next. So uh, Michael, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, Stan, that was a very comprehensive uh, report. Thank you. Um, we could have gone on, I guess, for more than an hour, more than two hours. In your uh, opinion, what is um, the future of Putin? Um, I don't know. 
I can't uh, believe what the U.S. media says. I think uh, I know. I think Russia generally r realize that if if Ukraine becomes a NATO member, and Russia is defeated in Ukraine, then it's over basically for Russia, and so they're backing Putin. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh our, our Tiki, I'm not sure if that's you, but uh, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Hi, yeah. Uh, so the uh, newspaper, The Guardian from the UK, uh, it um, uh, uh, had an article about uh, Israel and Morocco, which had uh, uh, have, uh, uh, you know, illegally occupied various territories, for example, Israel, the Golden Heights and Morocco, Mauritania, parts of Mauritania, and the US did not, uh, uh, or, or, or the Western nations of Europe did not uh, condemn that. Um, and at the same time, there are uh, newspaper reports from India and from African nations saying that um, Indians and Africans in the Ukraine um, are even now, as we speak, being treated extremely poorly and not allowed in as refugees, just like the Syrians on the Polish border, but the Ukrainians are. What do you have to say about that? Well, uh, yeah, there's a lot of racist stuff going on with who, uh, who they highlight as being uh, refugees and who they let in and who they don't. It's... Uh, it's interesting. The Guardian doesn't, it didn't mention how Britain occupies Northern Ireland. Huh? <laughs> no surprise, I suppose. It doesn't mention how the U.S. occupies Puerto Rico. Um, there's been a lot of uh, information about this discrimination against uh, Ukrainians. I mean, against people who are not white, blue, blonde hair, blue eyes. I mean, remember what happened to all the Syrians and all the Libyans who tried to leave in the Mediterranean and they were, what happened to them? They were not going to do that with the Ukrainians, I think. Though I'm not sure how many the U.S. will let in. I hear it's rather complicated. We probably won't hear much about it, but right now it's a good story for their war propaganda, so they highlight it. But yes, it's definitely a racist thing that they're doing with refugees. Okay, uh, HJ, HJ, you're next. Hi, um, Stan, just first of all, I think that was a, a great presentation. You covered a lot of ground, but I wanted to find out um, if you have uh, any idea now based on all of your research, um, have any I, um, speculation as to why US and NATO are escalating this war in Ukraine rather than moving towards a detente. And I guess I should, should say US, NATO and Ukraine. Well, uh, they want to, uh, it's like what they said in that National Security Agency document in 2015, that uh, Russia thinks that the US and NATO want to have regime change in Russia. Yeah, that's what they want. They want to get rid of Putin. They would, they'd be fine with someone like Yeltsin who just sells the store. They could be live with a leader like that. Um, but they see Russia as a major uh, threat to their world domination. I mean, what did they call it? Uh, the uh, world specter uh, dominance. I forget the phrase they have for that. Um, global dominance. Just means spectrum dominance. Yes, which basically means uh, we are able to go anywhere we want in the world with our military and do what we want. And there are two big powers blocking the U.S. from doing that, China and Russia. So the U.S. sees them as a threat to its world domination. And that's what it's after. It could easily, it could easily negotiate a peace in Ukraine right now. They wanted to make a ceasefire and say, okay, NATO won't be part of NATO and, and Ukraine won't be part of NATO. Fine, we everybody can live with that. 
Okay, yeah, okay, peace. The U.S. doesn't want to do that. So you keep killing each other. That's fine. That's what the U.S. attitude is. Um, so, I mean, uh, China has uh, economically, it's getting more and more powerful than the United States, but militarily, uh, Russia has nuclear weapons. So um, that's a big um, problem for the U.S. Okay, we're getting into, okay, the, okay, I have four people with hands, Ellen, Gian, Tracy, and then Charles. So Ellen, go ahead and ask your question. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, the, my biggest question is what, what, you know, what could we do? Uh, you know, what can the peace community do? Um, you know, restore right regulations or um, I think the fairness doctrine and I mean, like regulate NATO, um, I, you know, or and also I think Israel, uh, the Zionist. Have you heard of Jabiniski? He might be the one that is celebrated over there. Um, he invented the Cold War, um, and you know, after World War II and uh, the CIA. I mean, we Kennedy wanted to throw them out, you know, blow it to the wind, the CIA. But I. I can't figure out what laws, you know, international laws we should invoke other than the Nuremberg or Geneva. I, I don't see, I think America has to be treated like we treated the Nazis, supposedly. Or, do you have any ideas along that? Uh, well, we don't have the power to do that. <laughs> so We have the power to be bad. Why can't we make ourselves good, you know, um, regulate our own selves? I mean, we the people don't have the power to make the U.S. government do that right now. Why I, mean, not? I don't know when we will have it. Well, the U.S. people are not organized to do something about it. So <laughs> what can you do? They have the government has uh, overwhelming power. They could easily just start uh, saying, well, all these people in the U.S. who don't support us, they're agents of Putin, and they, we should uh, uh, put them in pretend, preventive detention till this war is over. They could try doing that. They, but that... Okay, okay, just, Ellen. I just don't think that's the way America... Ellen, Ellen, Ellen. Ellen, let's get on to the next question, okay? Gian, you're up. Um, okay, I just unmuted. Um, Stan, thank you for a very informative talk. Um, I have two questions related to the sources of information um, because how we understand the world is shaped by the sources of information we get. So my first question is, why do you think the mainstream media uh, only tells kind of one side of story and not telling uh, different uh, sources of a story. And uh, secondly, how do you get your source of information and which might help other people to find information other than the main, um, the main uh, media uh, sites? Well, I think uh, most of the the mainstream media is uh, run by corporations and corporations run the government. And I think there are six corporations that run all the mainstream media. So they have pretty much a control on the, what information they allow us to see and what they don't let us see. Um, that's what's behind that. For what I would look at for alternative sources of information, once upon a time, I would look at like uh, leftist websites, and now I don't think not so much. I would look at something like the Gray Zone with Aaron Mate. That's M A T E. He's a writer for them. That's one of his specialties. Has been uh, Russia Gate and Russia for the last five or seven years. Um, there's the uh, show on uh, YouTube with Jimmy Dore, that's D-O-R-E, that he interviews a lot of people about and talks about the war in the Ukraine that gives information that they try to cover up. And there's even uh, Tucker Carlson on Fox News has had a lot of very good information about uh, Ukraine and 
what the U.S. is doing in the Ukraine that is covering up. The other ones, uh, there's things like consortium news, and there's what well, there are a lot of um, different websites that are not very, um, you know, broad. There's also a uh, professor at University of Chicago, John Mersheimer. That's what M E A. R S H E I M E R. He wrote that, co authored that book about the Israeli lobby some seven years ago. He's been doing, or more than that, and he's been doing speaking engagements and Zoom meeting or webinars about um, how the US uh, created this whole uh, Ukraine information situation. Uh, I could probably list some more off the top. Well, I'd have to think. Well, uh, could you share some of the links and sources either at chat or email to uh, Tim or Charlie who can yeah, share with us? Be than, we'll be more than happy to do oh, it. Okay. What I about can... Caitlin Johnston? Oh, yeah. She has a, she doesn't have like a lot of research, really. It's more like political commentary. Yeah. But like Aaron Maté and John Mercer, they give a lot of research about it, like very precise, specific research. OK. Um, all right, Tracy, at one point you had your hand up. Did you still want to ask a question? Uh, yes, I do indeed. Thank all you. All right, Tracy, go ahead. Um, I would echo what some of the other questioners have said that was a wonderful presentation. Stan, incredibly informed. <clears throat> this is my question. I've seen, this is probably a silly question, no less. I've seen <clears throat> this recently, Sean Penn, I don't know if it was a tweet or some other medium where he said, I can't remember exactly what he said to the effect of he spent a lot of time around President Zelensky, and he has this glowing admiration. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you heard anything like that, and whether you did or not, what do you think about that? Well, I think Sean Penn was a big fan of uh, Hugo Chavez. That's interesting, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, Zelensky is really, uh, he doesn't have much authority on his own to do anything. He gets like ordered around by the neo-Nazi people in Ukraine and by the U.S. And um, so I don't know Zelensky. I mean, he's not a defender really of uh, of uh, Ukrainian independence. I mean, if you're just going to be a neo colony of the United States, then that's not any independence. If they just agreed with Russia, well, be neutral. At least you're like, you're neutral. You can have some independence, but just right now it's just a neo-colony of the United States that the U.S. is now oh. trashing to just bother to uh, make things hard on Russia. So I don't, I don't think much of that guy. I have a question. Uh, I, I, well, we're, uh, Lana, if you have a question, you got uh, three others in front of you still. I'll put you down on the list. Okay, Charles, you're next. Okay, uh, Stan, um, you said you wanted to considerable detail about what the United States has done and is doing. Now, the past couple of years, I've been personally undertaking the study a look inside Russia, such as John, John Gunther wrote a book in 57. And I interact with a good many uh, Eastern Europeans from the captive nations of the Baltic. And uh, the it's a little hard for me to believe that Putin and his Bolsheviks are, are like choir boys. Uh, this, is there any elements that you could say that would present somewhat of a balance regarding the conduct of Russia. 
Well, you know, the Communist Party there it hasn't been in power for 30 years, I will remind you. So to say that the Bolsheviks are running Russia is a little, I don't know where you get that from. Um, I never said any, they didn't say anything good about Putin in my talk. I don't uh, recall. They always called for negotiation. That's what they wanted, negotiation. That's fine with me. Negotiation is better than war. But uh, you cannot look at Russia today based on the Soviet Union 30 years ago. Um, it's a different country. It's a different system. That would be like being in a... 2005 going on and on about the U.S. Uh, war and the, the U.S. occupation in, in Vietnam when it ended 30 years prior to that. It's That's not, uh, I'm not answer that. I mean, that's not realistic. If you want to refine what you say better, I could answer it. Jake, you know how to unmute there. I think you're next. Yeah, I'm. I'm uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, can hear, you hear me. Okay. Uh, got two. Let me let me remember my question. Oh yeah, number one. Maybe there are neo Nazis in Ukraine, but if they're so prominent in the government, then why is why is uh, Vladimir Zelensky elected? He's Jewish. It's number one. Number two. Um. Uh, what was the other question? Um, what happened? In, that, what happened back in 1994 when when the uh, Soviet Union split up? What kind of arrangement was there between Ukraine? What kind of agreement was there between? I can't. Remember, it's not the Minsk Agreement, no agreement. But what kind of agreement was there between Ukraine and Russia? Um, that I don't know. Yeah, Russia split up when 1991. The Budapest yeah. Memorandum. Budapest Memorandum, right? Thank you. Yeah, I wouldn't. Okay. I wouldn't know about that. Okay. You, let me. Let me. Let me. Let, okay. Let me. Let me. Okay. Let me answer. Let me answer that because I know the answer to that. That is, in 1990, in 1991, uh, the Budapest Memorandum came down in 1991. At that time, Ukraine had about. Uh, they had about um, a quarter of the nuclear missiles in the world were in Ukraine, or 40%, I should say, were in Ukraine. The agreement was that they were to give up the nuclear nuclear missiles to Russia in exchange. Russia was to, uh, Russia was to um, allow for Ukraine's independence. They were not to invade Russia. There was an agreement between uh, then, it was probably Boris Yeltsin, and I don't know who the president of Ukraine was at that time, and it was probably under Bush Sr., was president here, and I don't know who's. I don't know if we co-signed it or the UN co-signed it, or, the, or, or who, other, who other parties co-signed it. But there's an agreement between Ukraine and Russia. When when uh, Putin in in 2014, when Putin invaded Crimea, that was that was that was seen by the Ukrainians as a um, as a violation of that agreement. So they see their, they see themselves as they see themselves now as um, as defending their homeland mm -hmm. against Russian invasion. That's number one. Number two, as I said before, if the neo Nazis are so prominent, then why do they have a Jewish Jewish president now yeah. in Ukraine? Well, uh, they are as prominent. I mean, they are prominent. I can't say that they're not. I mean, they're not in charge of the government. They're a force. They're, I don't know, maybe 10%, but they're armed in the, you know, armed group of 10% of the population. That would be yeah. significant. I'm not saying that, I wouldn't say that 
Russia had other options besides invading the Ukraine. And it could have, I mean, it might have later, but it certainly could have, I would have done other things first. If one third of the Ukrainian population is a uh, native speaking Russian, then it should not have been too hard for the Russian government to appeal these to this section of the population, that's one third of the population, to get their support for whatever military action Russia undertook, if it finally realized it had to, it decided it had to do that. But I don't, it doesn't seem like the Russian government tried to organize this one third of the population of Ukraine that should have just been naturally on Russia's side because they were being discriminated against because of their Russian the background in the Ukraine. Russia, I'm not aware that Russia ever did anything to um, appeal to these people. And that would be certainly be something you would want to do to make a war fast and get it over with is get a large segment of the population of the country you're invading to be supporting what you're doing. All right, it doesn't seem like Russia did that. Um, besides that, I said it should have also got gone to the UN and made complaints about uh, what the US and, and Ukraine were doing. And um, it is true, I don't believe when they said they would go in to denazify uh, Ukraine that that was the reason they were giving. I don't think that's a very legitimate reason. They could have done other things besides that. I mean, you don't, if you're going to go into a country and going to basically be destroyed then you know what you gain out of allegedly denazifying it is is it ukraine going to be in a better position when this is over no it's not so i it's unfortunate now what's going on i mean i put most of the blame on the united states for provoking this but uh, russia could have had other options to um than what it did and I'd also say that you can't really find any other like progressive governments that really support what Russia is doing. I mean, like I know I read Venezuela, what they say about the Nicaragua, Cuba, and I guess China. They're not like really big fans of this invasion because they think formally they all see it as being uh, illegal. But they don't really criticize it, but they don't really commend it. I hope that answers your question well enough. Okay. I, yeah, I have a question, but um, at no, some I, point. I have a question. Well, I have been waiting for. Have you still here? I believe Ernie is next. Next, Ernie, you're Ernie, you've got the next question, so please unmute. All right, I, I unmuted. Um, I have I have lots and lots of questions. Uh, by the way, I did enjoy your presentation a great deal, Stan, and and uh, you've done some research there. Um, but uh, I, I questioned some of your sources a little bit and your conclusions. You're talking. You you did mention about some fake uh, videos and so forth, which may well be the case, but there's some that are fairly real. I mean, the, the scenes of buildings being uh, shelled with artillery shells and missiles uh, in the cities and so forth. Um, I kind of have some confidence. They bombed the children's hospital. Now that children's hospital was basically not occupied at the time. Nonetheless, that's a pretty pr provocative act on the part of, of the Russians. Uh, and I would agree with John Mershamer and a lot of what he says, but I guess with regard to sources, uh, Stan, there's something you've been particularly good at in the past, and maybe it's time for you to, you know, pack your bag and put on your traveling shoes and, and go over to Ukraine yourself. You're good <laughs> at this and, and get the information right straight from the horse's mouth. What's the chance of you doing that? Yeah, about zero. Sorry. <laughs> oh, come on. Come on. You're not going to let a few bombs and machine guns scare you <laughs> off, are you? <laughs> I think uh, 
going there and say, I want to accurately report on what's going on is a kind of putting a target on my back. Mm -hmm. So, well, you don't necessarily have to tell them you're going to, you're going to be accurate. You can pretend well, you're just like the other journalists that I'm are not, over there. And, I'm not going you know, there. I went there back and I went to Kiev in 1979. It was a nice, beautiful city. I hope it doesn't get destroyed. Yeah. Wow. Great. But, um, I don't really know. Like with the news I see, I don't know what to believe and what not to believe. We're not going to know. We're not going to know maybe a year or two years from now how much of what we were told is BS and how much is not. So uh, there's no way for us to judge. So I just don't look at it. I, uh, one thing I would say is that it says there, I find the contradiction between them saying the Russians are attacking these civilian er areas. And I try to look at, well, so how many civilians died during this attack? And it's, it's you don't really get much information. It's like, well, so if they attacked a lot of civilians, they're going to be a lot of them are going to be dead. I mean, that's what the no. U.S. does. So, but so where? Are, why would the U.S. media be covering up civilian casualties by the Russians? But it, it's I don't see much. I don't know if any of you guys do, but I don't. The see numbers much. are small. Tons I think the numbers are small dead civilians. What's going on? And five hundred and something as of earlier today. Wow, that it's would be. Piece of cake for the United States to do. There's probably day. more like ten thousand when they get counted, but they may or not all be counted. You well, mean the civilian sure. deaths or what? We're talking uh, about civilian let's deaths. Move on. Now. Yeah. Hey, let's we're getting into cross talk. Yeah. Okay. Was next, and then Raj. Questioner was Lana. She had a quick question. So Lana, go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you. My question is. What do you think? When the sanctions will start working against Russia? What do you think? What's your opinion? Because you know it's so. So, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, it's already two weeks or three weeks. You know, Biden talk about sanction against Russia. You know, it's Russia, not Russia. What Putin did against this beautiful country which is bent, you know, it's unbelievable. It's not forgetful and it's not forgivable. So my question to you, what do you think sanctions will start working? Really, like really sanctions. Like now he wrote more sanctions against Ivan Putin, Medvedev, Peskov, I hope, uh, what's his name, Lavrov, because all of them lie, you know? I was in Ukraine, I was in Kiev, I was in Zaporozhye, I was in Dnepr, Dnepropetrovsk, I was in Ukraine, in this beautiful country, and, you know, and, and war supposed to be stopped, and again, what do you think, right, the sanctions will start to work against Putin, against what he did, thank you, I'm listening. Okay, go ahead, Stan, with your rebuttal. Well, I can't answer very well about Russia, but I imagine once the sanctions go in effect in Russia and they start to hurt Russia, there we're also going to feel the same thing here. And when we feel it a lot, well, I guess we already feel it with gas. But I don't know how much of that is actually due to the gas companies just using this as an excuse to raise prices and how much due to Russia. But That's Russia right. is a huge land that has a huge amount of minerals and natural right. Right. Uh, resources that United States and other countries need for their modern technology. And they're not going to have it. Something like palladium, I think it's called, it's used in computers. Russia has 50% of it in the world. So what's going to happen when they sanction this? It's going to hurt us. We're going to feel all this stuff. It's going to not just hurt Russia, it's going to hurt us. And it's not going to benefit us any more than it benefits Russians. Just like this war doesn't benefit yeah. anybody. Right, right. 
Okay, uh, I believe, uh, Ellen, you were next with another question, and then we'll go to Raj. Uh, yeah, I'm thinking, what about antitrust law? I mean, is, what gives the United States the right to eliminate their competition and maybe even try to occupy Russia, you know, destroy them with sanctions and economic warfare? I don't see where why we have a right and why the UN hasn't you know why we can't stop with antitrust law you know um, monopoly law corporate law that i mean this is why why they didn't do anything to us and i looked up sanctions it's we gave ourselves the, the us can give sanctions but if by the like patriot act if we're attacked then we get to use sanctions right. but but we didn't get attacked and you know and also I want to know if you know about NATO. I've read that the contract with America, the National Restoration Act, Security Restoration Act, we started giving three fifths of all our money to NATO. But what was the number you said the amount NATO has a trillion dollar a year budget? And mm -hmm. it, are we, you know, I don't, I don't think Americans know that how much we're putting into that, you know, um, you know, Trump had said he wanted to get rid of NATO, but then he gives a lot. Point of order, Mr. Chairman. Point of order, right, Mr. Ellen, I have actually Ellen. had my hand up for quite some time. All right. some Elvin, have two Elvin, I didn't see it. I'll, yeah. I'll get your after Raj, okay? Okay. I'm sorry about that. I got you on the list. So, Ellen, get your question and let's move on, okay? I just, you know, aren't there some laws, international laws, UN law, antitrust law that we can invoke. I mean, you've studied this stuff and I, it seems like that's what we have to do something with the law. Well, sure, there's the International Criminal Court. And I remember a couple of years ago, the International Criminal Court was gonna take, uh, investigate US uh, soldiers' crimes in Afghanistan. And John Bolton, when he was national security, uh, well, I forget what exactly his name was then, under Trump, he said, if you start investigating U.S. soldiers, we're going to sanction all the members of the International Criminal Court. And the United States sanctioned all the members of or the leaders of the International Criminal Court. So I, what right? so, mu That's so much. Law. <laughs> because they have a huge have the money? Mili right. they have a huge military okay. arsenal and no one else does. That's by what gives them the right to do that. Okay. Well, we need we, to take we, that. All right, Ellen, we have four more questioners yeah. coming up. Okay, so let's move on. Raj, you were next, and then I guess Kelvin, yes. Ron, and Doug. Uh, Stan, I want your opinion on this. Uh, the Putin has been there for quite a while now. He did not do well in uh, uh, in uh, Afghanistan, and uh, he hasn't managed his economy so well enough to come up. He hasn't managed uh, relationship with other countries to bring Russia to its potential. What is wrong with it? and 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 one more thing? And uh, I was I was so. So disappointed that uh, he he created that long line of uh, tanks, you know, and they're so vulnerable. And uh, and uh, what is he, is, he, is he smart enough to lead Russia in the future? Thanks. Well, I don't know if he's smart enough. I don't really know Putin. I can't speak for him, but you know. Putin was not around when Russia, the Soviet Union was in Afghanistan. So you have to remember, people don't seem to remember, Russia is not the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union ended 30 years ago. They had a, basically a revolution in uh, Russia and they got rid of the Soviet Union. And all the other countries that were in the Soviet Union got their independence. The Soviet Union does not exist. Um, I know I'm talking about Putin. Putin exists. Putin, and he's been quite a few. He's talking years about him uh, losing in well. Afghanistan. I was like, I don't know what. 
Okay, Afghani, forget Afghanistan, but Putin hasn't done well economically and he's not doing that well in a, Ukraine. For his kind of power, Ukraine should not drag on this long and it has. So Putin hasn't done well in a, in a Ukraine, Ukraine also. I Why? don't know. I don't know their war plans, but the only other leader that Russia had besides Putin, while there's Megdeved for a couple of years, was Yeltsin. And Yeltsin destroyed Russia. So Putin has uh, restored the stature of Russia in the world. So it seems to me he's doing pretty good. He gets elected in the, the elections. But I mean, compared to what we have for leaders with like Trump and Biden and Kamala Harris, like, I don't know. I mean, what? Compared right. to what we got, he's pretty good. Really? Thank you. All right. I, I, I'm I, sorry, Stan. I, I was going to go. You're about, to, you're about to lose it, aren't you, Tim? <laughs> yeah, I'm about ready to lose it, but uh, I got a good rebuttal coming up on this good. whole thing. Uh, I, think, I, honestly, I think he said I was next. All right, Kelvin, and then right. Um, and I've then got Kelvin. I've got several questions. Um, firstly, is about the general premise that you put on uh, in the first place uh, that uh, NATO and US are responsible for the invasion. Um, does that not sound to you like an, an excuse from an abusive relationship? You know, I wouldn't have hit her if she hadn't been flirt flirting with that other guy. Now, a, a lot of people will say, well, what if Mexico joined the Warsaw Pact? Well, what if they did? Does Mexico have a say in America's foreign policy? Why should America have a say in Mexico's foreign policy? Number two, the equation point, the uh, biological um, uh, labs, um, do you not think if you are arming a country and trying to defend it against an aggressor uh, that has a proven track record of using biological warfare, it might not be an idea to have some lamps that might be able to deal with that? And I speak as somebody who's been a victim of Putin's chemical attack in his country. And I'm talking about Salisbury here. Yeah, right? And the third one was apart from, apart from one year of buttons. Why is it uh, um, acceptable for Russia to annex the Ukraine? Because, as you claim, the majority of its part, the, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, not Ukraine, Crimea. Why is it acceptable for Russia to annex Crimea when you claim that the majority of uh, Crimean uh, people uh, would prefer to be part of Russia? But it's not okay for Britain to defend uh, a, a section of Ireland that has always, and that section has always wanted to be part of the UK and has proved so on many, many democratic elections and several negotiations with the neighboring country. Um, okay. I don't think I ever said the U.S. was responsible. I said the U.S. Uh, maybe instigated it. I didn't say they were responsible. And I also said that Russia had some choices that they could have used that they didn't. Um, and I just pointed out how the U.S. instigated it. Um, an awful what the of role world. of the U.S. was. An awful lot of your um, presentation was using the scenario that there is a racial conflict in uh, the Ukraine, and Russia was is kind of a police keeping force. Um, <laughs> if that concept was true, then. The, work, the Russians would have been wealthy a hell of a lot more than they are now. They would have had a hell of a lot more success than they had now, military success than they would have had now. Well, I don't know what Russia is trying to do. Maybe they don't want to uh, have a lot of civilian casualties, so they're they not... They haven't exactly been welcomed with open arms. Well, I... 
I can't believe what I see in any of the media. Um, I don't know when has Russia. As a cop out. Uh, 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 and especially from well, somebody. Guys, who, no, I no, cannot believe somebody, what they say. Somebody, they, have, they, have a, they have a proven re track record of lying to us. Well, so yeah, say I don't sure. believe it. But, is, but also, you, because you of my experience. your sources took a Carlson for Christ's sake. Yeah, but who's 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 lying to who here? Okay, Jake, let's let him finish. Okay. Okay. Took a call, right. took a call, admitted in court that he's not a news program; he's an entertainment show. Okay, uh, well, Stan, go ahead and finish the question. What can you say on. about that's the state of uh, U.S. media now that it's people who are entertainers are giving better news? I don't know about Russia ever used biological warfare. Uh, do you not know about the top the attack in Salisbury, where he took out Russian dissidents, and also uh, okay, you a mean British about policeman. using and it also against, a British uh, policeman and, and two British citizens? Well, that's not really warfare. They use okay. I don't know how true all of that is. I don't know. Well, in 2018, yeah, the streets of Salisbury. Well, yeah, I know about these. Uh, how much that I believe I is questionable. Some of that. Mm. I don't know which ones right now are yeah, but, yeah, but real people and die. which one are not. Yeah, but we yeah, yeah, right. gotta move on, gentlemen. Anyways, about Thank the Crimea, mouth. there was a vote in Crimea, as I said, I believe I said this. There was a vote in Crimea about returning to Russia. And there was an 83% turnout for the vote. And 97% of the voters voted in favor of returning to Russia. So to say that yeah, Russia- yeah. When was the vote Russia's, held and under what circumstances? Say that Russia seized Crimea. When was the vote held and under which circumstances? Okay. What circumstances? Kelvin, well, we're gonna I have can't... to uh, move on, all right? Okay. Thank you, Kelvin. And you're bringing a lot of good points up that I wanted to myself, but Ron, you had your hand up a while back, and uh, you're next, so please unmute and go ahead and ask your question. So you can hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Ron. Well, I think part of the problem is people have a short-term perspective on this, so they look at this as a fight between Russia and Ukraine and various players. If we back up a little bit and take it from the downing of the Berlin Wall and the fall of the, the Soviet Union to the present, then you see this Although promises were made of no moves to the east. Okay, Ron, the, uh, the, it's question time. Yeah, the uh, question is, yesterday there was a uh, statement issued by 130 prominent individuals calling for a new international security arrangement for the development and security discussion. Basically have an international forum looking at this role of the FBI as the, I mean, the uh, NATO as the bailouts structure for these international finances. And I just wanted to check if Stan had seen that petition that went out and then the, the call that was publicized yesterday. That? It was put out by the Schiller Institute. Uh, no. That NATO would be backing well, NATO is a policing agent for this uh, whole Green New Deal, the reset operation on these quadrillion, quadrillions of paper coming due. And so the whole regime change policy, everything that's been going on since we had an excellent opportunity when the Berlin Wall came down and that potential was there. How do we end up in this situation? As you've been saying, the, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. Um, and NATO did not cease to exist. It actually has bought, moved way beyond what the NATO structures were then. So my question was whether you actually uh, agree with a, a much broader international forum being set up to put on the table this kind of discussion of real economic development where nations run their own credit independent of this empire structure that's using NATO as the enforcer, which this war is just a predicate of. Okay, go ahead, Stan, get your you response. Know, I think that's sort of is what the Chinese uh, Belt and Road Initiative is doing to some extent. I don't can't really say to what extent it's independent of uh, NATO, but they are setting up their own international structure. Okay. Okay, um, 
Is that I it? Can, I have a question. Oh, well, Lana, 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 we got Ron just finished. We got Doug, then we got Jake, and then we got Joe. So, Doug, you're next. Doug Binkley, please. You're next, Doug. Oh, Okie dokie. Um, I'm sorry I can't, guys can't show you my face because uh, it might break the internet. Um, uh. At any rate, um, uh, yeah, um, Stan, or you, you um, presented a lot of stuff, and um, I admit that, um, you know, if uh, people weren't cr critical thinkers, they might uh, get confused by all of the uh, stuff you threw against the wall. At one point, though, um, you uh, implied that um, it would be better for Ukraine uh, to just give up because um, fewer people would get killed um, eventually uh, and uh, that um, they should just um, uh, uh, give up their sovereignty uh, because uh, Russia had invaded them as if, um, you know, if we extended that to World War II, I mean, <laughs> all the countries the Nazis attacked, uh, you would, I guess, be in favor of them just giving up uh, because that would, quote, save lives. Um, and uh, if you do agree with this premise that um, um, someone, a, a, a country or someone attacked uh, should just give up um, because um, to, um, um, you know, are you in favor of a woman that's raped uh, just not resisting at all, just, uh, you know, enjoying it, um, getting, you know, uh, as long as, as long as, um, uh, that doesn't cause them more trouble for the rapist and might uh, cause the rapist to, to hurt her more. Um, go ahead. Um, there are countries that are neutral in the world, like Switzerland, Austria, Finland. We're talking about a country that's attacked and invaded, and you acted like I'm, a, just I'm give aware. Up. I said, you probably go back before in the that Russia now. said. Uh, for a long time, they would not allow Ukraine to become part of NATO, that Ukraine can be neutral and that would be fine with Russia. Ukraine was neutral when they were attacked. They were not part of NATO. That's the whole problem because well, if they were, not. were part of NATO, the U.S. would be in there kicking Russia's ass. And you know that to be true. It's a, it's a mistake of history that they're not in NATO right now. But they were NATO. They were neutral when they were invaded. And they weren't even like a woman who was giving a come on and saying, if come on. If, if, they, if they Ukraine neutral was neutral, then what, why, is, uh, why is the US siding with the Ukraine and not Russia if Ukraine's neutral? Fighting with Ukraine? Why are they, why are they like, why, why are you is talking US, about? Why, why is the US right. say, uh, why don't we just uh, not take sides in this fight? And, and negotiate an agreement. Well, first of all, the U.S. is 100 percent backing Na uh, Ukraine and the Ukraine is keeps calling on the U.S. and NATO for more arms and everything. So, so when a woman's you, raped, can she can't call Ukraine for the police. When, it, when a woman's raped, she can't call for help from bystanders. Uh, I can't make up. Uh, you're trying to say oh. you're condoning rape or something. You haven't <laughs> answered the question. That's I why you went know. off on a tangent there. If you answered the question, I would accept your I'm answer, not, whether it was right or wrong, but I'm not answering. you didn't answer the question. Okay. Um, just move on. All right. We'll get a chance to everybody will be able to rebut here in a few minutes. All right, Jake, you had another question and we moved to Joe. Yeah, Jones. yeah. Yeah, you, you referenced before, you, you said before that Boris Yeltsin uh, uh, ruined Russia. How did he ruin Russia? Well, there's a huge amount of the, the wealth of Russia. All the and national enterprises were turned over to the private capitalists and other big guys in the Communist Party who went and just took all the money and stuck it in the West and just ripped off the country. And as you know, oh, so, so you say, so you're saying that, there, that, he was, that he was a kleptomaniac and he, he, and he ripped off the country. Well, not just him. I mean, a whole group of top officials in the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, or the different well, parties of the communist, different states. Right, the Communist Party. The communist, also, communist, the communist I mean, Party you can look at like the uh, 
the life expectancy in the country went way down during uh, Yeltsin years. Um, the population went down. The economy fell apart. It was a mess. The worst thing so Rick said, Yeltsin did was to pick Putin as his successor. And in that sense, he did yeah. ruin Russia. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. All right. So you're saying, wait, wait, wait. I got to follow, follow up quick. So you're hey. saying... You're saying you're saying what what, what Yeltsin did is he he started started the process of privatizing everything that had been run by the public sector previously, and in the process he did it too fast or he did it the wrong way, and that's what ruined the economy. Is that what you're saying? Well, not just they just ripped it off the people. It's just massive theft of the national resources. Which they did not even keep the, the the gains from it in Russia. All that money went into Western banks. Well, pretty much what Putin's been doing. All right, let's. Uh, okay, Joe, you got the next question. Joe Jennings, go ahead and unmute Joe. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> okay. Um, well, look on the Yeltsin question. Yeltsin. Uh, destroyed Russia by taking the advice he was given from Harvard and Yale and the shock therapy policy that was brought in as the, uh, mm. as the successor to communism. And as one of the speakers said, yes, Russia was alluded to the bone. But um, right now, yeah. consider the fact that hyperinflation did not begin with Yelp, uh, with uh, Putin moving into Ukraine to prevent um, nuclear or offensive weapons being placed in the hands of neo Nazis, which the U.S. installed. You know, and that and that uh, Putin and Xi Jinping shook hands at the Olympics for a new system uh, to cover each other's backs and to invite the U.S. to participate in a new paradigm for world development. And what's taking the world to nuclear war right now is that the U.S. is trying to defend an indefensible dollar through the threat of our military might. You know, and this is going to take the world toward nuclear war. And so what Ron proposed in terms of a new development architecture to replace NATO, which should have gone out of business 30 years ago, is the hypothesis that this group should consider. You know, Putin had to move because NATO was moving in. Uh, the offensive capability to destroy Russia, just like financiers in the West supported Hitler, you know, against Russia, you know, in the 1930s, and that's very well documented. Don't run away from that. Do you have anything to say about that? Um, I was. I'm trying to think. I can't remember what I was going to say. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Well, Putin has a very uh, vivid me well, historical uh, memory. Uh, I, his I, will his I, brother I will was killed I will by the Nazis. His you. father was You're almost good. killed. You know, and if the CIA is supporting okay. neo-Nazis in Ukraine for offensive war against Russia, you shouldn't run away from that. And that is extremely well documented. Joe, no, I'll, answer this. I'll answer this. I'll answer it with a question. Do your ex-partners have the right to date anybody they want? I don't know these references to sex. No, no. Do like, your ex-partners have the right to date anybody you want? Anybody they want? <laughs> I'm not going the, this route. No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> you, you're, you're saying well, this because, is irrelevant because, because no, no, it's not right because Ukraine used to be part of the Soviet Union, and now you're you're, you're complaining that maybe they're flirting too much with NATO, or they might just join this, or they might join that. Well, guess what? That's up to them. And it's up to Ukraine whether they join NATO, and it's up to NATO whether NATO joins Ukraine. Okay. It's the same with the EU. All right. It's now getting to the point where we're starting yep. to get a lot of cross. Yeah, where Ukraine voted to be neutral okay. twice in 1991, not to be part of any. Bloc. All right. Gentlemen, ladies. I've now exhausted my list of questioners. I'd like to now move to rebuttals. I'll give everybody about four minutes. Yeah, to, where's uh, my question? Oh, oh. You I did, wanna... I, Lana, you, you already went. Okay, you want one more question, Lana? Maybe. 
Lana's got the, Lana, be yeah, listen. Lana's got the last question and make it quick, Lana, please, so we can get into rebuttals. Okay, thank you. So, well, Mr. Stanley, uh, right now, China, they just start to shake up a little bit. You know, before, you know, even a couple months ago, they was really very, look like very good friends with Russia. Now China start to be, how to say in English, uh, you know, not to be sure um, to help Russia or not. So my question is, you think Chinese will understand more what's going on right now and they will try to do not sanction, but not really be friends with Russia? No. What do you think? No, China is not going to do that. You think they will? They will going to be neutral? No, I think that China will be supporting Russia and how it can, uh -oh. without taking a position in this war. Oh no! I'm sure that, that China realizes it's like what U.S. is doing in Ukraine against uh -huh. Russia is what the U.S. wants to do with Taiwan against China. Uh -huh. It's so like seems so obvious to me that it must be to them. Okay. Right, let's, get, let's get the rebuttals. Let's thank our speaker. Hey, thank our good. speaker. I'm going to go first and I'm going to require roughly three to four minutes. I think everybody will require about the same amount of time. I'll have a timer up with it. All right, Stan. You know, you ought to be thanked a lot for giving this speech, just like you and Fox News and everybody else. And I'm gonna and I'm gonna just play this quick video saying why you should be thanked. So just listen for about a minute and 23 seconds and I'll comment on it afterwards. So Charlie, just knock it off. I'm gonna share this real quick. At long last, the glorious invasion of Ukraine begins. Soon, the motherland will take the wayward province into her firm embrace again. Field Marshal Putin offers cheers and many celebrations for American comrades who showed loyalty to Mother Russia. We have much gratitude and thanks for Fox News, First National Comrade Tucker Carlson. For his loyalty, we'll receive highest Russian honor, the Order of Lenin. Thanks, Steve Bannon, admirer and student of Comrade Lenin, who led the Republicans to support of Comrade Putin's plans for Greater Russia. We thank GOP Comrade Senator Joshua Howe, who blocked enemies of Russia that the warmonger Biden wished to appoint to his regime. Russia wait 40 years for American Republicans to throw away disgrace of Ronald Reagan. Republicans say they stand for America. Red Putin knows better. Again, that's all I wanted to share. So, Stan, I'm just going to say thank you for sharing with us. Because what you're doing is you're promoting. Putin's, it is so striking to see how it is. It Putin's like awesome. I'm sorry, I'll get that off real quick. For Putin. Sorry about that, Stan. But uh, I just want to say thank you again, Stan, for standing for Mother Russia and all the atrocities she has committed. You see, Putin, Putin it, the reason he went into Ukraine and his sole reasons for going in are. He figures, number one, Ukraine really belongs to Russia. Two, Ukraine has been hijacked by the West. Three, that neo-Nazis run the country. And four, Putin must invade to free Ukrainians and protect Russia from the West. Well, if you believe those lies, Stan, I'd say that you're crazy because, first of all, Ukraine goes back almost 5,000 years and has a unique culture and identity similar to its own. And yes, it was under Russian control and their communist regime, but when it did go out, they actively chose the West. In fact, the majority of Ukrainians are pro-Western, and that's why they were coming to us. They didn't want to come under the yoke of, of 
Putin and the communist regime in, in Russia. Ukraine's leader is a true patriot. He's actually running his country and the Russians are doing it. You see, Putin wanted to invade to free the Ukrainians. Well, they didn't want to be freed. They wanted, they wanted to join the Western alliance and keep out the Russian dictator. And two, to protect Russia from the West. Well, when the Russia from the West comes in, um, you're crazy. Now, I'm simply saying this. If you can believe those lies that Putin has brought forth, or you can believe the American narrative that, that, that Russia invaded a sovereign state, that that sovereign state has been trying to defend itself. And the invasion of that sovereign state may get to be World War III. We have been restrained in going in because there's a little something called he has nuclear weapons and we don't want to use them. But I'll tell you, you know, Putin may just be crazy enough to do it. The thing is, even in his own mother Russia himself, he's had to put up, he's had to silence free speech. It's now 15 years if you criticize the government. Do you think you'd be able to do that? They have this forum there? No. Yes, we can also go back to Iraq too. I didn't like the Iraq war, but we did kind of have some reasoning with the destruction of the Twin Towers and the and people wanting to kill us. I don't believe exactly with what George Bush did, but I do know that uh, we did have a response. But it was only in response to something that was done to us. Generally, America is a peaceful country. I like having freedoms. I like capitalism. And if Russia really wants to succeed, they get out of Ukraine, they rejoin the world, they globalize, join with the rest of the world, and watch how fast the Russian people prosper. They have vast mineral wealth. That country covers a lot of territory. And if they would just adopt the free capitalist model, we might finally see that country succeed. China did a little bit of it, and that's why their economy start has grown. They didn't. It was corrupted under Yeltsin. They didn't get a chance to. It was nothing but a kleptocracy right now. And the reasons Putin's is invading is his kleptocracy is under attack. Thank you. Yeah, they need some sweat chaps there. All right, yeah. now. Quick, all right, quick, Joe, quick, you want to go? Quick, 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 all right, quick, now, quick, now we've done, I'm done quick, my rebuttal. Oh, now, now let's okay. get the list of who wants the rebuttals. Joe, okay. I see your hand up. You want to go next? Mm-hmm. All right, who else wants to rebut? Ellen, Ellen, Doug. He knows. Okay, uh, Doug Okay, so I, I got Joe. I have Ellen. I hey. have Doug Binkley. No, and I. Okay, uh, hey. I have Joe you know Jennings. Raj. I'm sorry. You know Raj. Raj. Yeah. You are, okay. You are and then, uh, okay. Kelvin. Kelvin. Okay. Uh, bear with me, please. I've got Joe, Ellen, Doug, uh, Joe Jennings, Ellen, Doug, Raj, Kelvin, Charlie. Ron. Ron, Ron has his name hand up. Okay, Ron too. And HJ. Okay. Uh, let me see if I missed anybody. Now I have Joe. I have mm-hmm. Ellen. I have Doug. I have Ernie. Raj. Get Ernie. I should. Well, no, no, no. I I'm, I'm, let, fin- let me finish to see if I have already. Joe, Ellen, Doug, Raj, Kelvin, Charlie, Ernie, Ron, and HJ. Am I missing anybody? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, Jake, you're. Oh, Jake. Okay. I'll put you after okay. HJ, Jake. Okay. All right. All right. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten people who are rebutting. I'm going to go with a four minute count. Uh, so that you guys can do it. We may be going after nine. Uh, yes. Uh, um, and of course, our speaker, Stan, will get the last word. Um, I've already done my rebuttal. I'll go with a three minute, I mean, a four minute clock, like I promised. So, Joe, you're next. You can take your hands down now because the rebuttal order is Joe, Ellen, Doug, Raj, Kelvin, Charlie, Ernie, Ron, HD, and Jake. I'll go last. All right, Charlie, I'll put you last. 
All right. Double so, the bill. All right. Again, I'm going to go over the rebuttal order. Joe. Okay. Um, all right, Joe. Just, go ahead. I'll give you three minutes. I, I just figured out uh, how to unmute. Um, <laughs> once again, guys, you cannot ignore, you cannot ignore the hyperinflationary meltdown of the Western financial system. Which you talk about capitalism for God's sakes. The markets have been kept on artificial life support for 10 years now by Federal Reserve bailouts. There's nothing free about the free market. Okay? It's a con game. And the rest of the world knows it. The dollar is sinking, right? You know, nations that don't agree with us, we sanction. We sanction our enemies and we sanction our friends. You know, the world is trying to figure out a way to function, to do its business independent of the dollar. That's why a hundred and over a hundred nations have joined the Belt and Road Initiative to get some goddamn development going. Okay. We've got to go back to a John F. Kennedy approach, peace through development, peaceful cooperation to develop the world and ourselves instead of trying to defend an indefensible speculative system through the threat of nuclear war. Putin did not invade Ukraine to take it over or restore the Soviet empire. You know, he, 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 he moved in because NATO was moving in uh, the capability to launch and destroy Russia with nuclear weapons and put them in the hands of neo-Nazis. And you're running away from that, for God's sakes. But it's the, it's the collapse of the financial system itself and the desperation that the elites see the world slipping away from them that they want to use you know, NATO as an enforcement arm for fascism. And Putin is very sensitive to that. You know, Putin, you know, Russia lost 25 million to Hitler, you know, and they see neo-Nazis being backed by the West in Ukraine. They had to do something. <laughs> So that's my rebuttal, guys. Don't run away from the collapse of the financial system and consider what Ron put forward about Schiller Institute and the new development architecture. That's, there's, there's leaders from nations all around the world that are endorsing this thing. You should consider endorsing it yourself. It's on the Schiller Institute website. Thank you. No problem. Thank you, Joe, for your rebuttal. Ellen, you're next. You got four minutes. Thank you. Um yeah, I agree with uh, Stan and Joe and, and Ron, uh, and I disagree with Tim. Uh, I see the, you know, the problem, you know, uh, you know, the economics that Joe talks about, I agree, you know, studying the history of these years, you see that really the, the United States position is really a monetarist fascist position that we financed if you read Anthony Sutton the World War II and World War One, you know with these monetary you know policies of total war you know um, and you don't see it because it's invisible this invisible empire new world order that's what fascism is and the propaganda that's so important what you picked up on and what we're seeing now one-sided like John said popular uh, propaganda, they, um, I research that needs to get out there. Uh, I've done a lot into the fairness doctrine. The FCC fairness doctrine was put in in 1948 when we created the CIA with Reinhard Gellin, the, which is now the B&D, but he was working and collaborating with the CIA, the OSS, which is like the SS. I mean, if you look at um, the SS, the the policies are really the same, this world policing, and we really had a strategy of tension plan to the Cold War, was like World War III, to um, use terrorist leave behind armies, which is basically NATO, Gladio, Team B. Um, Team B is this, this Israeli neocon, um, you know, group that planned the project for new American century. They planned to take down World Trade Center, like other false flags, using Saudi Arabia. Um, you know, you, so it's, these are false flag 
terrorist attacks always blamed on an enemy. Look at the um, power of nightmares. Adam, um, Adam, uh, the great documentary from England where um, they, we need an enemy. He takes it back to Leo Strauss versus, and then we manufactured Zawahiri and the Al Qaeda and the Islamists. You know, I mean, we Islamists is a, they tortured Zawahiri who was with, you know, um, basically, you know, he was to create ISIS. We created ISIS. We create these videos with them cutting off the heads and the girls throwing the things out. I mean, it is propaganda and it comes out of the ultra Zionist Nazis. You know, they, and that's why I mentioned Zabodinsky. There's a great book by Laurent. Um, actually, some of the best stuff here is through Kevin Barrett and Veterans Today and, um, you know, False Flag Weekly News. It, once you understand this false flag idea, which they've done with bio warfare, the United States is the leader. They took the, that from the Nazis and the Japanese, how to make biological warfare at Fort Detrick, which is why they killed Forrestal. This is since 1948. We have made, we made cancer through the WHO, through, um, you've got these books that show how that's, they were trying to kill Castro with that. And that's why David Ferry and but Kennedy, right? So the, the biological warfare is a lab they, to make poisoner in chief. Read um, uh, Stephen Kinzer, uh, Poisoner in Chief, all these books. The brothers show okay, how. Okay, Ellen, your you time's know, up. Ellen, okay, Alan Dulles, our Secretary of State, cried when Hitler died. They are, we are an extension of the Fourth Reich. Read Jim Marsh, the Fourth Reich, you know, and, and okay. put it on to Ellen, it. Thank you. Okay. Wrap it up, please. Thanks. Right. Okay, I appreciate your comments tonight. Doug Binkley, you're next, please. Four minutes, Doug. Doug Binkley, are you still there? You're on, you're on mute, Doug. Yeah, I'm sorry. I click I, my computer. When I click it, it doesn't always work. It's just the way it is. That's okay, um, Doug. You're, I, you're the rebuttal I, time now. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking that I should just put up with the bad computer, not get a new one, and send the money to Ukraine to help uh, defend themselves. Um, I've actually seriously considered going there and uh, getting a gun and uh, doing my part, but um, hopefully uh, um, they'll be able to defend themselves without the 67 year old uh, hands uh, having to, uh, which I've never, I've only handled a gun. My, my dad brought one back as a keepsake from, um, um, that's an interesting uh, sidelight. Um, he brought back a Luger, German Luger, which uh, he had gotten somehow from, you know, uh, uh, obviously a German had dropped it by the side of the road. He never actually had gotten into combat, which was very lucky for me because uh, he would have been in the machine gun nest. <laughs> they were training him to be run a machine gun. Anyway, that's beside the point. But uh, uh, Stanfield Smith, uh, uh, whatever happened to Mr. Smith uh, went to Washington. <laughs> um you're all over the place, but you've got so many of these crazy conspiracy theories in your talk. Uh, it's impossible to, to um, uh, debunk everything. Uh, I don't really know. Your, your major premise was that uh, somehow Biden and the West or, or NATO combined. I mean, and it's hard, hard for NATO to get together on anything. There's 30 countries. I mean, um, to provoke Russia into a war. First of all, did you ever realize that NATO was a defensive organization and it would actually, it's not supposed to do anything unless it's attacked. Now, I, I marvel you didn't mention the Kosovo thing. We, that's a whole other thing we could get into. And I objected to that at the time. So I'm consistent. Uh, you can't blame me for that. I know our country has done bad things. I know we invaded Iraq under false pretenses I was, I didn't actually go in the streets. I regret that I didn't, but um, uh, I was very much against that at the time. Um, and I know that uh, our government lied. So, and Ellen, you're right. A lot of every, everybody that says our government lies at, at times is absolutely correct. It's hard to trust the government. It's certainly hard to trust the media all the time. They are, the mainstream media is a corporate media 
and um, uh, MSNBC can occasionally get things wrong, but sometimes they don't go far enough. Uh, I don't know exactly um, um, every point that um, uh, I'm, unfortunately it's hard to put together a, a coherent, <laughs> complete rebuttal um, and get everything in in four minutes. Um, basically, um, there wasn't, a, there was, if you've forgotten what happened two or three weeks ago, um, Stan, you go by Stan or do you wanna be called Mr. Smith? Um, you forgot what happened two or three years ago. There was supposed to be some discussion. The, the diplomats were saying, well, let's get together. It was like the two days after the Olympics and uh, everyone was, remember was afraid that he was gonna do it. And then they said, well, that guy uh, in China isn't gonna want him to do it. So he's gonna wait till after the Olympics. And then it, there was one day that went by and I was very happy. I said, I went out and I got like $400 worth of food just in case. And, and then when nothing happened Monday night, I said, well, maybe it's okay. And they were talking about the diplomats were gonna get together and smooth this out. And remember about um, uh, the thing with the fishermen that the Russians backed out and instead of actually sinking some fishermen's boats. And I said, well, maybe the Russians aren't that rotten. Um, you know, maybe they backed off from killing the fishermen for no wow. reason. But they didn't do the diplomacy and then Putin attacked without warning, although uh, in US intelligence was absolutely correct this time. And you gotta give them credit, although they dropped the ball and okay, they let George up. W. Bush get away with something back in 2003. You've got to admit, Putin invaded a decent, honorable, neutral country. It was not in NATO. And the other point I'm going to put in very quickly, it was mentioned by somebody, the Budapest Memorandum, which obligated our country to protect Ukraine if they ever were attacked after giving up their nuclear weapons. It was a quid pro quo. Unfortunately, Zelensky, one of his greatest mistakes, never brought that up in okay. the um, days leading up to the unprovoked okay. attack by All Russia. Right, up, you never explained, Stan. You never went anywhere right. near explaining how it was, how the All attack right. was provoked. Okay, I'm up. done. Thank you. Thank, I'm thanks. done. I'm, so, I'm sorry to be so time conscious. All right, Raj, you're next. Go ahead. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is Raj Patel. One of the news this morning uh, was uh, Israeli Prime Minister Bennett. He had made a couple of trips to Soviet Union. And then uh, after coming back, he, he, he concluded that the Soviet Union's position of a neutrality for Ukraine is a right one. And a call of the Zelensky that uh, he, this is what he thinks. And uh, they strongly disagreed. But I mean, he's the only one probably trying something positive to get things together. Uh, um, I look everything from American perspective. I do not want, I do not want, and American people do not want any more foreign wars. We are tired of it. We have been doing for years and years and years. No matter what our team says, you know, we screwed up every single country we invaded. We we never built them up and we destroyed so many lives, we killed so many people, and we lost so many of our boys for no reason. I think uh, in, in a Ukraine thing, uh, in Russia, not my favorite country, Putin is not my favorite politician, but uh, we don't have much to gain, and I don't think we have much to fear from Russia. Uh, we, we've been fearing for, uh, I don't know, as long as I can remember, and Russia was paper tiger. They never had a big ability to back pain or a big for us. And we, we try to create these monsters and we want to slay them. And they were not monsters, neither in Iraq, nor in Iran, nor in the Serbia. They were not monsters, they were not a big people. But uh, we, we do not have a policy of negotiation. We are very bad in a diplomacy. We are very bad in negotiation. Right now also, Blinken, he was in Europe running around everywhere, but uh, there was no consensus among Europeans. When, when sang finally sanction thing came up, and uh, German, uh, France, UK, they were on a different places. They were not in the same place. Everybody had to be corralled to go there. And uh, we, 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 cannot, uh, we cannot continue like this thing. 
we are the biggest country, we are the strongest country, we are the democratic country, we are the freedom of speech country. We cannot go and we have to image, we have to have status, we have to magnanimity. We are, we are good people and we have to bring a peace and everywhere. We cannot, we cannot devilify people. That, is, that should not be us. Okay, we, people, people have problem, countries have problem, much more serious problem than we have. You know, we are, we are less than 5% of the world, we're using 25% of the resources. So, I mean, lots of countries, they don't have food to eat, they don't have a place to live, they do not have a, anything for future tomorrow. And we are going and destroying the country and trying to create a war. That is simple. I think Biden, Biden is a weak leader. And uh, he's not able. He's not able to convince a single senator who is not for him to join him. And in his own party, senators are saying, "Hey, you know, they are not behaving." And we have too many old people. I'm sorry. I'm I'm old too. But uh, so many old people at such a high level in a government is a bad news. We are not training leaders for tomorrow. We are not training the population for tomorrow for a younger, dynamic, thinking leader who can think in terms of modern terms, okay? The, the, the lots of, see, Israel, lots of, lots of young people in America, they think they're, well, we should be doing, behaving better than they are doing it. Lots of thinking leaders are doing so. And everywhere in the world, there are lots of new leaders waiting. But, you know, our old people are stuck and they don't want to, they don't want to give up their power. And it's a sad, sad thing. Hey, Raj, we can do a better world. Okay, we can do a better, better world because we have resources, we have technology, we have money, we have know-how. We know how to manage things. We should be doing good. All Thank right. you. No problem. All right, Kelvin, you're next. Uh, okay. Um, there are several uh, factors in the media world that we occupy. Um, one, of course, is America. And you know the Holly, you've got Hollywood and McDonald's and everything else. Yeah, you're the you're the big stack at the poker table, right? There are other players. There are Israeli propaganda. There is obviously cor corporate interests that that goes with uh, with with, Amer with America. There's China, and there's also Russia. Now Russia doesn't play poker. It plays chess. Now, there's a reason why Russia is good at chess, right? Because when the, when the Soviet Union was uh, it instigated in 1917, right? Few of the, uh, the guys played chess anyway, and they realized, how can Russia shine? And chess was cheap. To get really, really good at chess as a nation, all you need is a classroom and some, some boards and a teacher. It's cheap. And Russia and, and the Soviet bloc countries use the same scenario for lots of other sports, like uh, women's shot putting, right? Really cheap to get good, good, good at women's shot putting, isn't that right? Yeah. Now we have the internet. And it's really cheap to sow disinformation. It's really cheap to start division. And there's been results. Brexit in the UK was disastrous. Trust me, it was fucking disastrous. QAnon, do you think that, oh, that, that there's no Russian bots involved in QAnon? It's cheap. You weaken the West. Now, yeah, you support Trump, who may or may not be a Russian spy. I'm not really going to go into that, but he's a useful idiot for Putin. <laughs> and a lot of other people said, you just you sow division, and then when West is at its weakest, then you invade. I'll finish on that ahead of time, Mr. Okay. Speaker. All right, thank you, Kelvin. Um, I guess, Ernie, you're, you're going to be next, then I'll give you four minutes. So uh, go ahead and uh, start, Ernie. 
Ernie, are you there? I am here. Okay, okay I'll start the Very clock good. now then. Go ahead. Yeah, anyway. Um, I have to I have to have some sympathy with Stan on one thing. Our media, our government, and generally our people are extremely biased, highly biased in favor of Ukraine on this. And in fact, I agree. I think uh, Russia, it's an illegal attack on their part and we should be supporting them. In fact, not much more. We shouldn't be getting out. We, we should be doing more. Nonetheless, it's good to hear the other side. And that's why I liked uh, Stan's presentation and some of the uh, rebutters who are bringing up the other side of the issue. I think, uh, I think this is always good. The one thing that we heard very little of, uh, Doug finally brought it up, was the Budapest Memorandum, uh, which was uh, essentially an agreement made, I believe in 1994, between 1994 and 1996, uh, between the, uh, the major powers and the minor nuclear powers, including Kazakhstan and Ukraine, the people who had nuclear weapons left from the Cold War. Kazakhstan gave theirs up without much of an argument, but uh, uh, Ukraine held out for some protections. They were called assurances. And as, as legal flegals will do nowadays, that uh, Ukraine is being attacked uh, the U.S. and the West in general, the NATO countries are saying, oh, we didn't guarantee the safety of Ukraine. We gave them assurances. That's not the same as a guarantee. So we aren't going to get involved. Ukraine is on their own. Uh, yes, we're doing some, some sanctions. God forbid uh, Moscovites won't be able to get Big Macs anymore. Uh, that'll bring them to their knees. Uh, this obviously it's making life tougher, but it's not what's appropriate at this point. Uh, we should be in, we should be helping them. I think a lot more than we are. We're derelict in our duty uh, with this. Uh, technically, I guess it's not a treaty. They're saying, well, it's not really a treaty, so we don't have to go by it. But we did guarantee them when they gave up their nuclear weapons in the early '90s. <coughs> and and you know, when are when are countries of the world going to realize? for once and for all that they can't depend on the US, okay? We've made so many promises to help people that have helped us, uh, the Kurds, uh, the, the Iraqis that were against Saddam Hussein, et cetera, et cetera. We said, oh, we'll help you. You go, you go ahead and, and take some action. And then we just left them hang. Uh, we've done this so many times. When are people gonna learn? And where, where this is important, I think, now we've got some countries in the world that we would like to see not get nuclear weapons. Iran and North Korea uh, are, are the, the primary ones. If, when they're watching this, what are they gonna say? Wait a second, these people gave a security uh, assurances to the uh, Ukrainians if they gave up their nuclear weapons. And now what do they got? And Libya, same thing. Uh, when, uh, you know, uh, Gaddafi was, was left to, to hang and dry when he gave up his nuclear weapons uh, by the West. So I, I think that the, this is a very bad precedent that we're setting. I think it's problematical. Uh, one last note of that, a couple more minutes. We're talking about uh, a, a, a fly, a, 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 what do you call it? A fly zone, a, a no fly zone. I, we're not gonna do that, which has shown Putin especially the little interaction between Poland. Oh, we'll do it. Oh, no, you do it. No, you do it. Okay. We've both shown Putin that we're scared of him. And therefore, uh, he knows that when he's done with Ukraine, he can probably go on from there and do more. And NATO or no NATO, uh, we're, we, we don't want to mess with him. We're scared of him. We prove, we've proven okay. that. And that's a very bad thing. Thank your, you. Your, your time's up. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Ernie. Ron, you're next, if you're ready to go. Yes. Give you four minutes, so go ahead. Well, people should remember the, um, the words of the uh, most, <laughs> most competent and effective general we had in the United States, a fellow by the name of Douglas McCarthy. And he said at the end of the, uh, the war, that war can no longer be considered as an option to resolve our conflicts. And this was speaking to a, in a situation where the United States was the only nation at that time and still that 
actually used thermonuclear weapons against populations. Now, what people don't know again, and this is why I'd like to address the question of, of people being little armed generals as opposed to taking the advice of the uh, commander there, we kind of pontificate on these things. We talk about no-fly zones, but we don't think about what it means to then enforce a no-fly zone and you'd be in a war. But people have notions that you can't have a thermonuclear war because it's unthinkable. But you have people actually playing with ideas and scenarios that you can have, even limited nuclear wars. If you look at the statements of Wicker, these senators and everybody else. So the thing I want to get to, if you look at this solution, because the bombings of Nagasaki and Hiroshima were due to reinforce the colonial operation coming out of World War II, as opposed to collaboration of Russia, China, and development. So we didn't use the American technology and capabilities to go to the next level, we lost that opportunity. Like we said earlier, we lost the opportunity in the downing of the Berlin Wall. We did everything wrong. Now, here we are today with a project of Lyndon LaRouche and the parallels being picked up around the world where the Chinese and 140 other nations and the Russians are all saying, without using LaRouche's name or making the parallel, they're saying, let's have the arrangement whereby we build the infrastructure that we in the world need and that is 1.5 billion productive jobs globally, 50 to 60 billion in, in the United States, 1.5, yeah, 50 to 60 million in the United States. So why isn't that a subject? Well, Joe referenced it earlier. We've got a bailout procedure going on, which is protecting this whole mountain of gambling debt, which includes a trillion dollars of drug money. So we go to this new order and freeze that mountain of paper and hammer out the development deals we start shutting down the entire operation that's funding the terrorism through the drug money, and we can actually solve this, never discussed. So there is your media as part of an entire international cabal that with Roosevelt's death after World War II and the killing of Kennedy, well, we never took it on. We as a people had other things to do. Well, that whole operation is now on the table. We're gonna either freeze that mountain of paper quit bailing it out and sabotaging ourselves. And we're gonna join with other countries and we're gonna build an American system out of this like Abe Lincoln did with the greenback policy. You can read the history. So people have to learn a couple of names. They should look up Victoria Newland, the person who was actually the point person to topple an elected government in Ukraine and brag about the fact that they established the coup. So the question of Ukrainian sovereignty should also address the question, did that sovereignty start before the coup or does it just start after the fact? So we have a situation where we cannot miss another opportunity and we can actually join this international discussion where that you have a Russia, China and India, other nations and a sane United States. And let's put that whole financial bubble through an ordinary bankruptcy tied to trillions in development. And we'll have the biggest boom we've ever seen. We'll actually solve these problems. So if you can go to the Schiller Institute site, you can sign on to that petition. You can go to the LaRouche site and get the tools on how you do this. And people, frankly, have to quit being little armchair generals out here, debating and pointing to various kinds of things hey, they um, really have no history of. So let's get to the solutions. Think okay. about solutions. All right, Ron. Thanks uh, for uh, your uh, comments. Mr. Speaker, can I just no, no, no. add you're, something you're, to, what, to what Ron Melvin, said? Melvin, no, you, you spoke already. It's rebuttal period, H.J. Okay, I did put it before time. Just to say, to say, just say, Ron, just say please, what you said about the not a non Who's not supposed to be speaking now put themselves on mute so I can. Okay. Okay, H.J. is next, all right? So go ahead, H.J. And, and, I, and I want to thank everyone for um, just making time for this. This has been really interesting. I've heard from realists, neocons, progressives, and everyone in between. And it's uh, the, the spread of information has been far wider than I've been hearing in the mass media as of late. So it's been really refreshing. I wanted to share something um, that I found really interesting with all of you. It is um, a, a writer um, talking about an interview recently held with a man by the name of John Robb, R-O-B-B, -B, 
um, who has in the past advised the US government on how to deal with insurgents during the Iraq war. And his interview was about the situation in Ukraine. And during that interview, he said, he has a theory of what he calls in quotes, open source insurgency and warfare conducted by distributed networks rather than directed hierarchically. Rather than coordinating with one another, individual actors choose to contribute to a plausible goal. Often they are motivated by empathy triggers. He says that the reaction of so many companies and organizations sanctioning Russia within just a few days could not have been organized by the US government. The network, or in parentheses, the swarm, emerged spontaneously in response to empathy triggers coming out of Ukraine. Because of his theory, he says he was tracking this from early days and saw that the first to promote the cancellation were members and organizations of the resistance to Trump. The problem with the network is that it has no limits. Regardless of whether Russia gives in, the, the swarm's demands will increase until they include deposing Putin and disarming Russia of its nuclear weapons. Now this will never happen, but the network also lacks a sense of its own mortality. So in its monomaniacal focus on punishing Russia, it takes no heed of collateral damage and risk, like the risk of nuclear war. I think this connects with Trump derangement syndrome, TDS, and also with social justice cancellations and in the persecution of the unvaccinated. The bottom-up emergence of a mass that pursues the destruction of a victim is theorized by Rene Girard in his theory of the messes and scapegoating, by Matthias Desmet in his theory of mass formation, made famous around COVID, and by Hannah Arendt in some of her work on totalitarianism. Um, and then he also mentions Byung Chul Han, I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly or her name, who described the digital swarm of social media. I talk about this in my, okay. Um, I think we are in very dangerous a situation where a non-human entity, the swarm, is pivoting from and attempting to destroy one target after another, pulling our institutions, governments, firms, NGOs behind in its wake. There is no one in charge. Even if we avoid blowback from its actions against Russia, the fundamental problem and danger will not go away. Not only do we have no way to establish control or limits over this phenomenon, most of us are not even aware that it is happening, even as we become wrapped up in the mania. Lots to think of. And if you'd like some more information, by the way, I was reading this from one of my favorite websites called Naked Capitalism, which um, and its subtitle is uh, a blog about um, fear, fearless commentary on finance, economics, politics, and power. Thank you, everyone. I uh, thank you. It was a good response, and I really appreciate it. Okay, Jake, you're next. Um, if you're here still, unmute Jake and go ahead. You got four minutes. Jake? Jake, are you there? Jake, you're, you put your hand up and you're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you, Jake. Go ahead and get started. Uh, okay. I got, a, I got a quick question to Tim. Um, where, where, where did you get that tape? I'll send you a link, Jacob. What it? It's in the chat. I, I, uh, I don't have. I'm not, I'm on the phone, not on the computer. All right, Jake, go on a computer, and just uh, why Google why Putin will lose. That's what. Why the what? What, why what is Putin it? Will lose. What? Why, why, why? And then, if you want to see the other video, go to the Lincoln Project. Go ahead and keep talking. But what, what, what's it called? Say it again. The Lincoln Project. No, so what's the name of the tape? Why Putin will lose. Oh, why Putin will lose. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, just okay. Um, yeah, yeah. The question of neo Nazis. Um, they um, on Amy Goodman's show the other night, Democracy Now, they quote they went to 
Kiev, they showed some elderly Russian Jewish women who were Holocaust survivors, and they dispute Putin's claim that they're neo Nazis in, in, in Ukraine who are who are a threat to them. Number one, number two, um, they they also went to the Donbass and they interviewed some Russian women who were saying if Putin is so if Putin is so um so, Putin is so concerned about us, and so why is he bombing our territory? Um, yeah, this, this this whole thing is problematic, and I agree that NATO should not be expanded east of Germany. The uh, Part of the irony coming from, again, some of the commentaries, you may dispute this here, is that with Putin going into Ukraine the way he's doing it, the way he's going... The, the the result will be there'll be several other countries who want to join NATO now. So he's he's working against his own cause. Um I, I see Putin as the aggressor, not the Ukrainians. They, as as uh, several uh, Ernie and other people have said there was this uh Budapest agreement in nineteen ninety four, um under Boris Yeltsin and I don't know who President of Ukraine was at the time that uh, they would hand over their their nuclear weapons to Russia in exchange. Russia had to respect the territorial territorial uh, their their um, uh, their uh, national integrity and their independence from Russia. Okay, Jake. Uh, dispute, dispute, no, dispute between Russia and Ukraine is not new. It goes back to Stalin's time. <sighs> Um, Ukraine is historically the breadbasket of, of the Soviet Union, and under Stalin, Stalin went in there and tried to um, what's the word? Um, collect, he tried to create collect, He tried to create collective farms. There's a lot of a lot of um, and he created a lot of animosity amongst the Ukrainians because they had family farms, that they, independent family farms that they wanted to hold on to. And the result was that there was a strong anti-communist movement in Ukraine dating back to the 1920s. A lot of those people ended up in, in concentration camps in Siberia. So there's long been animosity between Russia and Ukraine. And yet there's still, there, there are a lot of commonalities, too. Similar, very, the languages are very close. Um, culture is similar, etc. Okay, uh, Jake, if you're done, I'm going to ask. Um, you. Okay. okay, all right, all right. Thanks, Jake, for your rebuttal. Uh, Charlie, you're yeah. next with the final rebuttal. And then uh, Stan will be able to get the last word. So, Charlie, go ahead. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Stan for a well prepared uh, presentation of uh, factoids uh, regarding. Uh, his views. It was well put together, and we look forward to seeing you speak again in a few weeks at the college. Uh, I'll be eclectic as usual. I have only five points to make. Number one, in order to understand the situation, you have to understand Russia and the Soviet Union. The history of this nation begins, it's a separate, so you have to understand that the Russia has always been apart from the West. And the history of the country begins centuries ago with Peter the Great and other guys like that. And it didn't drop out of the sky and start only 10 years ago. So there's no terminus to the history of causality. Number two, another thing you want to study is the history of invasions, such as in the mid 20th century, I also recommend every invasion. Invasions are hard to justify. Nevertheless, ancient Rome invaded every country of Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa. And they actually, the Senate debated and said each of those military endeavors was justified, amazingly. Number three, during the week, somebody sent me a map of the countries that recently joined NATO. And the question immediately came to mind, if these countries have self-determination and they wanted to join NATO, why, 
why should they not be allowed to do so? Very simply, if they feel it's advantageous to the security of their country or for whatever reasons, they don't have to give a reason. If they want to do it, they can do it. Uh, number four, regarding invasions, again, I remind you what they said when China invaded Tibet. The Tibetan monk said, if you weren't here before, then maybe you shouldn't be here now. Uh, and number five, um, uh, well, I don't even know what number five is. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, you did pretty good. And uh, uh, all right, looking forward to your summary then. Thank you. Okay, Stan, you get the last word in, so go ahead. All right, I'll just say a little. Um, now, there are three of you so far who don't seem to recognize that the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. It hasn't existed for 30 years. And the Communist Party in Russia, they have one, but they are not um, in power. And Putin is not a member of it. So to try to equate Putin with being a communist and being with the Bolsheviks and with the Soviet Union uh, is, I don't know how to respond to people like that because it's just, um, just totally disconnected from reality. Um, we should, uh, I think the main issue here is how are we going to resolve this war? Are we going to, is escalating it going to resolve it or are negotiations going to resolve it? Um, you escalate it, it's kind of why the U.S. doesn't want to get a no-fly zone because that means U.S. planes are going to be attacking Russian planes and that is going to lead to a major war in Europe, if not around the world, and that could lead to the end of everything. So escalating it is definitely not a good idea. And negotiating, I don't know if any of you could say, yeah, I hear uh, the US government talking about uh, we should uh, need to intervene and negotiate a solution. They're not doing that. And the people that are going to pay for this are the people in Ukraine. And we cannot say, yeah, we're defending the people of Ukraine because we want to continue this war. That is, uh, they're not going to get anything out of this. It's going to be, a, Ukraine will be turned into like Libya. When it's out of the news and if Russia is, moves out and it's, 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 it's defeated or if it takes it over, you're going to have to rebuild the whole country. And it's, you know, when the U.S., um, they've forgotten about Afghanistan now. And now it's a mess. There's like verge of mass starvation. They, there are slave markets after the U.S. overthrew Gaddafi in, in Libya. And were they talking about that? No. As soon as this war would be over, Ukrainian people would just be thrown away and forgotten about. And the U.S. would be focused on something else. So... If we want to find some peaceful solution, we have to be supporting negotiations and we have to listen to the people on the other side who want to negotiate. Otherwise, you're just going to get war. It really doesn't matter, you know, if you think you're going to be right in, in a war, well, I would rather negotiate and find some reasonable solution to all sides that benefits people as a whole and we can start solving the real problems that face humanity, like global warming, that <clears throat> we are not doing anything about. And that's going to be intervening in our lives very uh, rapidly soon, as it said in the UN General Secretary. So with that, I will stop. All right. All right, Stan, we want to say thanks a lot for, <laughs> for your <laughs> yeah. And just as a little bit of humor at the end of this session. Uh, I, let's let's turn all... off the recording, Tim. Okay. Anyway, Tim, you guys have a good enough. day. We don't need that.
<laughs> I just thought so. All right. Thank you, everybody, for attending. Yeah. Uh, stick around for the after party. Yeah, good one. Thanks, Sam. All right. I'm, I'm going to stop yeah. the recording now. Thank you for attending.